answers to them, talking about game development and stuff that's going on in 2020, and maybe even doing a little bit of performance optimization. So I just want to say welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Please say hello in chat. And hi, everybody. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, Andrew, Yorai, Jason, David, or Warp. I'm just going to call you Warped now because your name is Warped Imagination, Dave. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome, guys. Thanks for being here, and thanks, everybody, for coming out to join us. Please hit the thumbs up button, share the stream, and subscribe. And if you have a question, you're here with us live, you can submit them down in the form or in chat. I keep an eye on both, but there's a form in the description. All right, so how's everybody doing? You guys have a good New Year? Yep. 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 Nobody's going to say no that they had a terrible New Year's, that everything went horrible, their game blew up, and nothing like that? Well, well, if I'm being honest, I, Christmas was fine, but then I came back home after Christmas to a house that's freezing cold and the heat doesn't work, and I sat here in the cold and ate Chinese food. So it's not exactly the most exciting New Year's of my life, but it was fine. Part I didn't hate it. it. It would have been terrible, but then I noticed that new Cobra Kai season came out, and it was uh, it was awesome. So that's that, that's what I did. <laughs> Totally redeemed, huh? <laughs> totally redeemed. It's one of my favorite shows ever. It's fantastic. Nice. That's good. Everybody had a good New Year's, I guess. I only had one problem. I blew up um, my little lighting controller, so I've been playing with all those lights behind me, the ones, the <laughs> LEDs that I want to put up and playing some games on. I did a little short showing, uh, playing a little platformer and a couple other games on it. But when I was messing around with them, I saw a smoke start flying up out of this thing and it started smelling and it is now long dead so i had to order a couple more luckily those things are only like eight bucks so it wasn't it wasn't a big loss <laughs> yeah. can you can you live without your fix of lights and effects for for that time it takes for the new delivery to come through well you scratching it, your arm it, looking for some more new light effects right i still got all the old lights all, everything it's just it's been difficult to not put up new ones and i got a uh I've got a giant, I, I got to pull them out, a big box. There's a bunch more of those panels. I've got a giant stack of them now to start wiring up, but no controller to control them. So I got to get that tomorrow. Tomorrow I got a couple more coming for backups when I blow those up. <laughs> get it up and running. And then it's been a lot of fun just getting Unity stuff up and working on there, though, being able to show what's on, on screen and game up on the display and you know, do some interesting things there. I don't know how much fun it's going to be, but you know, I like at least experimenting with the projects and making some cool things. Like Dave's done a lot of this stuff, so for him, it's probably been super boring. He's like, "Yeah, that's easy. Do that shit all day." No, like, it's fun. LED. I <laughs> I no, I enjoy. It. I just bought I a like, brand new soldering. For... I just got a brand new soldering station uh, for my workshop. So, yeah, nice. I need to. Yeah, Dave, what are you doing with it? <laughs> Yeah, are you going to build something awesome? Some oh, I'm display? always having to do some World soldering Cup. every now and again, so it's good to have a better soldering station. My oh, old one okay. was just my old soldering iron was crap because I used to use a, I used to go around a friend's place and do it all, but now I'm doing it all here because uh, you know it's yeah. easier okay. just okay, to walk nice. into the other room. Yeah, uh, so yeah, new soldering station, so that should be fun. Well, I, I plan to come do it there soon too. So. <laughs> yeah, then your then your chipsets might not start lighting up on fire. Oh, they're not it. supposed to smoke. No, Sorry, they're me. not supposed to smoke and set a light and stuff. Oh. I've changing lessons here. <laughs> <laughs> Learning all kinds of stuff. I, I thought that just meant it was going like turbo speed. It's a nitro. Yeah, no, that's probably you. But the lights turned off. So it didn't seem like oh. it was working. Okay. <laughs> uh, water cooling. Yeah, no. oh, yeah, was, it's just saying I should put it in a cup of water. No. Keep it cold, no. and then it'll go super fast. Got no. it. All right, I'll bring the water to your house, Dave. Right to Andrew's no. mug. All right, so uh, I guess uh, I know me burning stuff up. We could start to maybe jump into questions if you guys are ready, unless anybody's got anything else, just big announcements or things you want to share before we get started with questions. I can finally put polls on my channel. Oh, I've yeah. noticed they've yeah. been doing them. I've been voting in all of them. Unity, like that, not Unity. Sorry, YouTube. You, it says, "Oh, you reach 500, and it's all good." And I was like, "Hey, you reach 500," and then it's like, "Yeah, no, you have to wait." After you've done that, you have to wait a while before you can do any of that sort of thing. 
Uh, oh, yeah, I think I they can. do like a verification that you're not some sort of weird bot or spam or thing, like a human verification. For then, a... then they failed because everybody calls me a robot, including my wife. Um, <laughs> you're I'm not I enough my... of a robot. I rival Zuckerberg head. sometimes. Um, yeah, no. So, yeah, I managed to do that and uh, start putting them up for people selecting which tutorials because I've done so many of them and they're just sitting there ready to release. Well, I, I got outvoted on the last one, so I have to wait for the next one. Oh, which one did you pick? Uh, which one did I pick? I can't remember now. I just remember it wasn't the one that won. <laughs> I uh, expect you probably picked something like preprocessor directives, didn't you? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, know yeah. The I, one I, 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 I think some of them might just have to be released rather than put to a poll because I think some people will, will always go for some of the other ones. But yeah, so I'll release that video after the stream. Nice. Yeah, yeah we'll have to put a link up there. And you never know yeah. what's going to be popular. I found that like I'll make a video on something yeah. I think nobody's going to like and suddenly it's my number one video and I spend two weeks working on something and nobody cares about it at all. Yeah. Little do you know, it's all just the memes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't do memes. Again, robot, it doesn't work for me. Yeah, if just uh, turn off the uh, poker face module and then uh, be a bit louder, and I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do get the monotone. To, <laughs> do tutorials on a monotone all the way through it, because, yeah, that's just me. Nice, deep, croaky voice. You got to get really, really excited, Dave. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right what about you andrew anything else going on over there in no the I, I had big plans this last week to get tons of work done and then family and friends came came up and i ended up visiting friends three times and family came over for two nights kids and it was fun because they're cool now because one of them's finally like talking but she hasn't stopped talking but i gotta <laughs> say she's five years old and and you know with the pandemic i haven't seen her that much but she's super cool and she saw my game collection here, and I wanted to bring out a, a game called Dragonwood that's great for, for five-year-olds who are interested in games um, and a little older kids who might not be as interested. And she saw Thunderstone Quest, which is a fantasy game, straight up like monsters. And she saw the cover, and she's like, what's that? Because she's totally into dragons all of a sudden. Like, she knows everything about dragons. So I open it up and show her the inside, and there's, there's like five or six miniatures in there. And she's like, oh, can I play with those? And so I looked throughout those and the ones from the Clank Legacy game, the more miniatures, all swords and magic and all that stuff. And she spent hours nonstop playing with these things and making them fight and all this other shit. And I'm like, holy shit. If I had known she was into this stuff, Christmas would have uh, had a slightly different presence. It was all dragons, but it could have been more than just dragons. It was fun. <laughs> Dude, so, that, that's good awesome. Year. Yeah. There's a lot of board games back there, too. So she was all into the fantasy ones, huh? Turns out, yeah. And her brother is, like, um, he's almost 12 now, and, and he's never been that into board games. He plays it a little bit. He's I got him Dungeons & Dragons once. He wanted it one year, but he never really played it. So I'm thinking, you know, it's she needs to get all the hand-me-downs that he's been <laughs> getting. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I don't know if I've been sending you pictures. I've showed a couple pictures of... Uh, my three-year-old, she's constantly in my office playing Street Fighter now. So she plays that thing every single day. She comes in and wants to play Street Fighter. She's got it all figured out. She knows her favorite characters are Dollism. And uh, it was Zangief because he was in Wreck-It Ralph, but now it's changed. She likes uh, Zang she likes Zangief, Dollism, and uh, I think Juggernaut. And oh, Magneto is her other favorite because the X-Men versus Street Fighter. It's just hilarious watching her play those things. So. I never expect that a three-year-old would be into those kinds of games. Yeah, I guess no, you, never like know. you never know what people are going to like till you put it in front of them. Yeah, and then it will surprise you, and and it's crazy. Most definitely. All right, anything else before we start taking some questions? And if not, is there a question that you guys want to jump into first? There were a lot of them. Looks like quite a few new ones have appeared since we started the stream, even. Oh God. It's just that when you were saying Street Fighter, I was actually playing some Street Fighter myself when I was traveling home uh, on the bus with my new toy. So I got oh, my, I my analog yeah. pocket finally arrived. So I've been I've been playing a bit of uh, Street Fighter yeah. myself, just <laughs> kind of fun. The screen looks great. It's hard to see now because probably isn't yeah focused, but you know. No, it looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Qu quite a nice little toy. So 
Nice. And you want to tell everybody real quick who's watching what that thing is that didn't see it? Because you, you talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Coming and what the device is. So do I have the other ones? I'm, I'm not going to go dig out my army of Game Boys. Basically, this is a Game Boy. It's a Game Boy that looks... It's about this. It's actually kind of slightly larger than an original Game Boy. So it's it's not small. Like it's a chunky toy. It's it's hard to see here, but compared to my phone, it's like quite quite a bit larger. Uh, granted, that's a folding phone, but still, it's quite a bit larger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's a cool it's a cool toy. The main thing is it's got the 10x resolution, so it is considerably sharper and easier to see. Um, and what's really cool about it is unlike emulators it's actually you can play original cards like it plays the actual original stuff and i have adapters for it too so i can play other different platforms and it plays all the original you know game boy game boy color game boy advance i have cheated a bit because i have put a everdrive card in it so i'm basically emulating anyway but i don't have to i do actually have original games i can put it in as well um yeah it's just a it's it's a nice uh, modern game boy it's USB C. comes with a charging dock you can plug it into your tv in a high resolution and it's like I said, it uses the original chips. It's not, it's not just emulation. It's actually hardware uh, yeah. rendering. So, what platforms cool. did it play? I forgot. It was like um, Game Boy and a lot of the Nintendo out of the box. Games. It plays Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, and uh, original Game Boy. And then you have adapters. Do I have one of them handy? I might have one of them handy. Uh, I don't. They, they have these little plug-in adapters you clip into the back, and then you can play. Um, oh god, there's like five or six other platforms. Um, I, I can't remember offhand, but if, if it's if it's a portable handheld with a cart from pre PlayStation era, it probably plays it. So nice, that's that's really cool. I there basically go. got it for Game Boy, so I didn't look too hard at everything else. That's basically all I wanted. You got to play some Street Fighter though. Yeah, and I played a bit of Advance Wars, and then I was playing some uh, Pokemon as well, and. One uh, retro one just for me personally is called Wario Blast. It's it's literally Bomberman, but Wario is the star, and it's got bosses at the end of levels. It's very fun. Nice. All right. Well, you guys ready to take some questions? Yeah. So was there one that stood out? There's a whole bunch. I mean, I can pick one out of here, but I don't know if anybody's got one that they really felt strongly about and wanted to answer and have a discussion on. Uh, I think we could go uh, in the order they came in, so we don't miss anything. That that works too, unless no, if nobody's got anything that stands out, let's go for it. So here, I'll just start. Uh, you know what? Let me pop them up on screen so that way everybody can see what the question is while we talk about it, instead of um, me reading it and then they they miss it and and can't ask. Just make sure not to show the emails, I guess. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, I'm just going to pop them up like this. Uh, Okay. So, what questions help you define a game idea so that it becomes tangible for management for development? Tangible and manageable for development. So, this was one about design. There were a bunch of questions about design, some about code, and some that are in the other column that seem to be mostly about marketing and sales stuff, but a couple other things. So, this was one of the design questions. So, just, I guess, uh, what helps you define a game idea so that it becomes, I guess, something that you can pitch or develop on or build around, right? So that it's, man- I guess, manageable. I guess, really, it's for yeah. development, not so much for pitching, right? This would be after yeah. you it's, develop it's, it. Or yeah, so it. In, in concrete terms, it's you have a game idea. How do you turn it into a set of tasks that people can act on, the tangible things? And then how can it end up being a product that you can do anything with play (laughs) the game? So um, you ask the defining question. It's kind of the point of it, which is, if I need to make this, how do I need to make it? What is it? Is it a 3D game? Is it a 2D game? What genre is it? Do I need to support uh, multiplayer? Do I use any specific input uh, device? what do I need to do in order to execute a user's story that uh, is that game idea? Like, it can take many form. How do you actually imagine it going? What do you imagine doing? And how do I turn it into um, a set of tasks like that? 
Yeah, and anyway. I, I would say on a on a broader scale, um, the the specific name for this is literally project management, and that's not just to like that's a nice term. That's a, like if you Google project management, there are books, there are classes, there are courses. There, it is a topic. It's an entire coverage thing, um, and I say that because there's a, a general a general misconception that a lot of this stuff, like there is unique steps required for each type of project, but fundamentally the way you do a project is the same, regardless of whether you're building a chair, organizing an event, or making a game. It's fundamentally the same thing, which is decide what you want, break it down into its constituent parts, make a list that you can verify. Uh, there's something called SMART, which is for project planning, um, and it basically highlights that if you take any project and you want it done, it has to conform to these rules. First one being S, specific. You need to actually have a goal in mind. It has to be a tangible thing. Measurable, you have to be something that you can tell that it's done. You can't do a project if you don't know when the start or the end is. Um, I don't remember all the other acronyms of it, but it's fundamentally smart project planning. Um, it, it, it boils down to attainable. Yeah, there you go. Attainable, that's, that's, uh, you can actually do the damn thing. So saying I want to go to the moon tomorrow is probably not an ideal goal to achieve for project planning. Um, what's the other ones we have? I know, one, I know the last one's time. I forgot what the R is. But either way, it's project planning is, is simply make something achievable, figure out what it's going to be, structure it, make it into a checklist, take through your checklist. So uh, uh, R is the one that people uh, tend to ignore in game development. Oh, realistic? <laughs> yes. I'm going to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, the pipe dream always hides that one. It's I, I'm going to make a, a thousand-man team-sized game by myself over the summer. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. And with Let's the key, this going. <laughs> uh, it's time-specific. It really is like setting an actual timeline and, and a yeah, deadline. Yeah, and, on, and, on, on and that's also that's not arbitrary. We've said it before. Uh, a project will expand to fill the time given. If you give yourself two years to do a project, you might get it done in two years. You give yourself six months to a project, you might even get it done in six months because you'll, if it's, if it's too long, you'll procrastinate in doing it. Obviously, you don't have to be too short either, but in general, you should never have a project. Separate from that, one piece of advice is you should never have a project that takes longer than a year to do. That's not to say you can't do a project that takes longer than a year. But if a project does take longer than a year, it should be split up into parts that can be quantified at the end of a year, which is like a phase, which is doing your, your prototype or doing whatever. You shouldn't say, I'm starting a project that takes five years, especially if you're not experienced at doing it. You should split up your projects into, I will make a prototype for my game. What, what does that constitute? Well, I will make a proof of concept. What does that constitute? Well, I will make a test level that's a vertical slice. So what does that constitute? Well, and you build it down to, how will I spend my next three weeks? Something like that. that that's, what, that's what they mean by time. Give yourself something that's a goal that's structured within a two, three week period, because then you'll actually do it. And then you can measure your burn rate later by continually doing this and then tracking how well you're conforming to your own timeline. And if you're misunderstanding your own expectations, if you pick too big of a timeline, you're likely to be way off course and not know it. If you pick smaller wins, you can keep checking yourself to make sure that you're achieving your goal. And if not, you can move your deadlines. What about you, Dave? You, you do lots of, uh, this kind of stuff, project management, or at least you have in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's all great advice that story's giving there. Um, so when you're defining a game idea, going from a concept, a lot of times I say to people, break your game up into what it is. Uh, you know, break it up into its components, break it up into its mechanics, its controls, what features it's going to have. List them all in a document, build an entire document that has all that stuff. And then look it over and say, can I build this myself? Can I build it in the time allotted? And if not, what could I build in that time? What can I build myself? How can I get something achievable done? So it's, I'm just reiterating the stuff that Story said there. Um, if you build out so if you plan if you have a great concept you, you've just watched an anime or something like that you go oh a game that does that would be amazing and then you go and write yourself a one-page concept document which is what you should do before you start any of these sort of things you know write something down is it literally when you've written it down sleep on it read it the next day and go did i just get caught up in the moment 
is this actually going to be something good? And then look at the core mechanics and the components of it. Maybe build some of those things before you even start into anything majorly tangible to make sure the game at least will have a fun element going into it. And that's where gray boxing comes in and using your imagination. You know, I say to a lot of people, especially with VR and stuff like that, play the game before you've even written anything. Just do it in your mind. Get out there. Play the game with your hands. And use your imagination to, to see if the game would be fun before you even start into anything. And then, yeah, you, break it all you, up. You bring up a good point with VR, and this is one that really, like, shocks me. It's, like, I've done this with the classic cliche with doing pen and paper stuff or going through that. But VR especially, I noticed. I've had a lot of fun ideas for VR projects, and I did exactly that. I mimed it. And the minute you hold your hands out and conceptualize playing it, you're like, oh, this sucks. This is horrible. I hate yeah. this. uncomfortable and boring. It's amazing how quick that cycle is where you can kind of – someone says, I want to, like – a." floating screens where I can touch all it's like yeah but hold your hands up for five seconds and see if that's still if that's what you is is that how you want to engage with that kind of information and very quickly VR can tell you it's, whether it's fun or not because it's a it's a physical thing yeah and even on some of the normal games I mean if you can sit there draw something on a pit on on a tablet or whatever and put it up in front of you if it's going to be an RTS or something like draw some pieces and drag and use your mouse and pretend you're playing it just to have a bit of fun and and see if it's going to going to work out and then have core time. When you set your timelines, set points at which you can dump the project if it's terrible. Set points at which you can show other people what the project is. Uh, don't sit in a silo forever uh, building a project because as soon as you come out of that silo and you show it to other people, you might find that actually what you were thinking of is just not fun for anybody else except you. Um, yeah, so... Before I start, I always create a concept document. I sleep on it and then look at the concept document over. And then before I start a major project, I'll write a design document. And that's just not a full-on, this is the design of all the mechanics and all the rest of it, but I lay out the components. I lay out the mechanics. I lay out the controls. I lay out everything else in a very brief document, but it tends to be about 50 pages, funnily enough. And that I'll do before it goes into anything else, just to make sure that everything in there is possible to do that nothing conflicts straight off the bat. And then I break that into a backlog. And then once I've got my backlog, I break that into core systems and everything, how long it will take me to build each thing. I put states and milestones in there to say, at this point, I want to do this, and I want to have this running, and I want to be able to show it to these people to see if I can get this sort of reaction. Um, and that's what I do uh, for all these major projects. Those are projects that can go for years or months. But as story says, if you're going for a, or if you don't have a milestone within a year, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. You will never complete that project. Get milestones at significant points in the game's development, and you'll progress much, much better than just sitting in that silo, building that thing out for years and years and years. I've seen people build games for five years with no design document. No milestones. They just wake up in the morning and go, today I want to do this. Today I want to do this. And, oh, I got bored of doing that. Today I'm going to do this. It's not a way to work if you're going to start doing this in a professional capacity. Yeah, that's, make that's, it hard to get things done. Yeah. It's hard to get them at the physical level. <laughs> it's good advice. I think it's, it's, it's as a, from a hobbyist perspective where, you know, a lot of people, even in the chat, asking questions about, you know, how to do this mechanic from a popular game – what we really start doing is recreating our favorite games, right? We, we, we take a game that we liked and we said, okay, well, I want to make a version of this. And, you know, when we're still learning Unity, it's, it's, it's difficult to say how long it's going to take us to implement a character controller, how long it's going to take us to create our first level, because we've never done it before. And um, so having milestones is good, but we're going to miss a lot of those, especially because there's going to be a day where you have a nice six hour chunk to sit down. This house is quiet and you're going to get so much done and you're going to, you know, first hour goes really good. And then all of a sudden you run into a problem. You're like, wait, how do I do that? And you get into this issue that you can't, you can't move on without figuring out how to do this new coding thing that you've never done before, but you're trying to wrap your head around five hours go by and you're like, wow, I did one thing today. That's great. You learned one thing today that you didn't know before, but it can be, you know, suddenly this, this, it's like a time dilation of, how long it takes to finish stuff. So I think these are great ideas. Um, and, you know, one of the things that is important is to then also know, especially when you're learning, I think, 
uh, uh, new things and you want to have, you know, you've got grand plans to recreate these games, knowing when to say, I'm done with this one. I've learned what I want. This wasn't my real goal. Did I really want to publish this game? Or was I, the reality is most of us, when we're starting out, we're, what we're really doing is learning. The game that we're going to publish should come later, maybe. Um, and don't stop believing that you're going to publish your game. But understand that the first one, the second one, the third one probably won't be those ones. And instead, learn what you need to learn. Get those down so that you can make better predictions about how long it's going to take you and what your capabilities really are. Um, so you don't make a 100-person uh, game by yourself. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. So that is, I don't know, all around good advice. And uh, there's a comment about your lack of a cap on here that just totally distracted me, Andrew. You're finally showing the hair, huh? It's been a few weeks. It's been a few weeks. Yeah. I, I, I uh, Last summer, I had to shave my head for a little bit, and it was really ugly. So I wore a hat, and then I got a haircut, and then I stopped wearing a hat because I don't like wearing hats. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. They give me a headache really bad. But hoods, all day long. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's a funny side note with hats. I went back through, this came up at Christmas. Somebody said, oh, so something about wearing hats. I went through my Google photos for the last 10 years. There were two photos of me with hats in 10 years. I don't wear hats either. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody got any last thoughts on this? Or we jump over to uh, a physics-based question. I wanted to uh, just mention that when David talked about how today I'm going to do this and today I'm going to do that, um, it hurt me on a metaphysical level because in Terraria 1.4, which was a 3.5 years update, by the way, um, we had a situation where some things did not have decisions made on them that we no one had the capacity, the, the, the authority to answer. So we had to keep task switching. And it ended up in a situation where some of these tasks became daunting because you couldn't finish them. So everyone was like, today I'm going to do this. Today I'm going to do that. Today I'm going to do this. We had more than 20 unfinished mechanics and ta major tasks that we couldn't touch. And it was like, it's all kind of working, but we can't do the last steps on it. And don't reach that state, please. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was I, I just want to say it was the most amazing sprint in the end to just wrap them all up because that felt legitimately amazing like this works now polish this works now polish this works now polish and just fantastic it all came out okay but don't be that person don't 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 start test jumping close off things so that the other people can act on them properly <laughs> like there, 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 there is the problem where if you have something unfinished and people try to give it feedback, you say, well, no, it's unfinished. Don't give it feedback yet. And then if there is more than one of these things, it ends up eroding people's ability to tell you if your game idea is working because you're just denying all feedback possibility. Just wanted to touch on that. On and, and one of the things... I was going to say, you, you've never seen a more disappointed developer in your life than somebody who puts all their heart and soul and effort into something and they don't do that. And then when they're finally done, they try their own thing and go, oh, it's terrible. I hate it. And they know they hate it and they know it's bad because at no point did they white box it or did they test it. They just, they had an idea, they thought it was good, they'd finish it. And then when it's done, it sucks. And that happens. And that's because you're not iterating. And so like you really want to get to a point where very quickly you prove out the idea before you invest mm -hmm. too much time. Like it's, it's, it's all a battle of resources over time and your best to get to a good result. You need more feedback. So early produce something, let people rip it apart. And until you know that the idea is good before you even begin the real work, then you'll save yourself a, a lot of time. I was just going to add, on the other side of things, don't become the perpetual producer if you're a single-person indie team. You see a lot of people that they'll have a Trello board or something like that, and they'll have tasks. They spend more time moving tasks around and switching things up than they do actually working on the project. Plan your sprint. Do your sprint. Then plan your sprint, do your sprint. If you're sitting there constantly adding, removing tasks and changing the backlog every week, every day, every hour, you're not doing it right. 
And there are a lot of people that become perpetual producers where they literally can't get work done because they're immobilized by the fact that they don't know which task to do and which task to put back and all the rest. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you make a list, don't color code your list because once you start getting into the fun, quirky, let's add icons and things, that's where you know you're already on the wrong track. When you're spending your time yeah. designing your listing tools, if you want a really quick shortcut guide on how to do that properly, you first write down your overarching goal. Then you split that goal up into your milestone. So in an ideal example, by the end of a year, I wanted this. By the end of six months, I want this. By the end of a month, I want this. By the end of the next three weeks, I want this. And then this week, I want this. And all the other ones should just be a line or two. And then once you get down to the three-week mark, that's where you go in and start turning it into a list of features. And then once you break that down into one week, that's where you break it down into tasks. And then you take your tasks. And personally, I don't break it down past that at the start of a week, I will then start my morning with the, this is the stuff and I will take one of them and I'll break it down in the morning to what the day's tasks are because you'll be, you, you might approach it differently on different days. So I don't like to pre plan too much of that stuff. And so you sit down, grab a coffee, take your start, your starter, your list of your week, do the day one and then take every one of those off. So effectively, just like you're saying, don't over egg all of it, only write the foot, the cliff notes for all of that stuff and it's only when you're actually about to do it do you plumb out the details about what you're doing otherwise you'll write a, a fantastically huge hierarchical potential list and realize that half of it's not usable when you actually sit down to do it and two more things to add to that um if you are going to have a lot of tasks make sure to set a time where you're going to update the tickets for them because you don't want to constantly go in and change a ticket, go in and change a ticket. One good practice is do your tasks for the day and at the end of the day, show what you did. Like change the tickets to update that. You don't have to do it on the moment. And another thing is make sure you buffer for unexpected situations. One of the things that will rip you apart if you have a hard deadline is that if you say, well, if we do everything perfectly right, we will hit that deadline exactly right. And then the smallest thing will take you out of the entire rhythm. Everything will go haywire. You will not follow the track anymore. And people are going to get disappointed. Leave a room for things to change. And I can give mm. one example that happened um, in Relogic. Uh, we uh, made a prototype of something we did for training. Just make a prototype of a game within a month. And... Um, within the third week of the uh, prototype, we said, well, we are going to try and hit something this uh, by the end of this week. And I didn't uh, know that uh, one of the employees had to do another task and they won't be available for the entire day because of it. And that completely threw everything off and we couldn't reach that task. It was unreasonable because we didn't buffer for it. So from experience, it sucks when you don't buffer for mistakes like that. And and it's not just mistakes either. Just as yeah, a, a very strong warning is that there are people, like I've managed a lot of teams and there's certain people who just panic when things don't go well. And that's fine, that happens. So if you give someone a task and it's just not doable because of sometimes vendor issues or third party issues or whatever, you can find yourself in a task that you actually can't solve. You either can't do yourself or the time frame is suddenly extended. Um, if you get into that situation, rather than just sort of holding on to this task that's uncompletable and then panicking and then throwing off your entire sprint of what you're doing, you can create something called a spike task. And you have to acknowledge that this is a thing you're allowed to do. If something is going out of scope or something has become too complicated or someone says, can we do this feature? And your answer is, I don't know yet. I don't know how big it is. I don't know the library. I don't know the API. You make a spike task. And a spike task is a task where you acknowledge, I don't know. I have to find out. So the task is learn how to do this or figure out the estimate for this thing. So sometimes a task itself isn't achievable, but what you do is you, you, you can either put it back on the backlog or if it's a new task, you could say, okay, first we make a task called find out how long it would take to do this or find out how to do this and then put that on the log. That way it's still a task. You're not blocking yourself. It's achievable. And the answer might be it's not possible. And then the other one comes off the backlog. So don't... <clears throat> Don't block yourself by getting stuck in an endlessly undoable task. If something's starting to waste your time, make it a spike task. Cool. Well, you guys want to jump on to this physics question now? Yeah, I guess yes. 
We got we got a lot on that first one. I don't know how many of these we're going to get to. I think we should probably start picking our favorites because we're 30 minutes in on one question. <laughs> so I, we'll see how this one goes. It says, what was the most important or what would be the most important aspect for designing a new physics system? So yeah, it, to give context, it was somebody making a mobile sim racer that includes both cars and motorcycles. Um, so it's it's a vague task, a vague question, because a physics engine has a lot of important aspects. Which one would be the most important? The one that makes sure that you can deliver what it's actually used for. Why? Which I mean, it can be the most accurate physics engine ever, or it can be an engine that makes a fun game, which is what you wanted in reality. Um, when people make an engine, they have the tendency to creep uh, decisions and design things that were never part of the scope. They never needed to be part of the scope and all that other stuff. And also f physics are complicated. Uh, so uh, be very careful with what you're trying to add with that. Um, so yeah, for me, it's the, the most important aspect is it is able to deliver what it was actually added to the project for. Yeah, I have an interesting, I had a, project that somebody rung me up about and they said they wanted to build, they had this toy plane and they wanted to build a mobile app that let people pretend they could fly this toy plane. And at the beginning of the call, I went, yeah, this is what he went, but it's got to be real plane physics. It's got to be, everything's got to be correct about the aircraft. And I said, this is a casual thing you're creating. Like if you did that, people are not going to be able to learn how to fly this thing and have fun doing it but they insisted on it. So I created it for them. And at the end, they were like, this is too hard to fly. Like, yeah, it's because it's realistic. I said, luckily for you, I knew this was going to be a problem. So press this button. They pressed this button and it went into a game mode, which didn't use very realistic physics. But oh my God, the game was fun. And that's something that a lot of people miss when they go, we're going to make the most ultimate physics thing possible. Unless you're making flight simulator, step back a second and think to yourself, uh, who's going to actually start up my game and spend that long learning how to play this thing to go on. And obviously I'm talking more sim games because this is sim related. Uh, you know, you're looking at Half-Life or something like that. It's a different kettle of fish, but yeah. Anyone else got and, thoughts on this? You're, you're all right, you got more? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that usually when people say I'm going to make a physics engine because I have a unique scenario I haven't seen with an existing engine, I think that's a trap that people yeah. are bound to fall to. And what you actually want is something that fakes it, the, the thing that you wanted to have and is just fun. By which I mean, if you have a car, it can be a sphere that's rolling. It's invisible. Nobody can see the problem as long as the car drives straight. And if there's a bump, it goes up. If there's a, a area to fall, it makes an arc. But all that ha can happen without any crazy physical simulation of every individual wheel with a big box that has an engine inside that does combustion to push things forward. <laughs> Just no need for any of that. You don't know. In fact, actually, the wheels. I, I'd, I'd go one step further and say that in game development, in games in general, one of the biggest sins a game can commit is where something isn't repeatable in a way that's reliable and understandable. Because what you don't realize you're doing as a game developer is you are creating a universe and world for the player and you're defining rules. The gravity of this world is X. If you press this, this will happen. If you're on a ledge and you do this, this will happen. It's about defining rules that are reliable and repeatable for a player because they're making judgment calls. They're deciding how they'll play based on the rules you give them. And let's be real, a lot of physics is not super repeatable if you don't know what you're doing, especially if you're talking about a slidey capsule collider on a cliff. Shout out to Ukulele when it first came out, and it was horrible, to be brutally honest, compared to Banjo-Kazooie that it was based off of, because Banjo-Kazooie didn't try to use realistic physics for all of its interactions. Because what happens is you can't rely on it as a player, and it starts to feel horrible. So you have to ask yourself if it's really important to you to have realistic whatever versus is it fun? And if it's fun, it has to be repeatable. And if it's repeatable, you can fake a lot of it to the point where it's much, much more enjoyable. And it's not like you can get pretty far. Like, I'm not saying don't do 
physics at all, but I'm like, there is some really interesting, you can basically just write your own Euler integration. Just here's a vector for velocity. Here's one for acceleration Add acceleration over time, but like a few lines. And now you've got a more manually controlled physics engine. You'll get more features out of physics surfaces and using physics materials and adding your frictions and all that stuff. But now you're going to start getting rigid body collision issues and things clipping into each other. And that's perfectly fine if it's a physics game. But if you're talking about putting cubes on switches, do you really want people clipping the boxes through the floor? Is that is it important for is, is the extra bit of fun you think you'll get from a slight bit of physics interaction worth the fact that now your game can bork itself if it's done incorrectly when you can just hard code a lot of this stuff and it still feels good you can throw the physics cube across the room but when it hits a wall turn off the rigid body go back to simpler physics there's a lot of things you can do to make it to walk the line in other words physics doesn't have to always be as realistic as you think it does so it's interesting because i read this question and i think you know the first question for me is are you so are you working on a game that you want to release, or are you building a physics engine? Um, because to me, those are two separate things. Where if I'm, if you're building a physics engine and you don't care about finishing a game, you just want this engine to do these various things, then go back to the first question, put out your milestones, put out the design of what aspects of the physics you want it to do uniquely or differently or specifically. Um, but if you're making a game and you're basically saying what I'm really doing is making a mobile sim racer that includes cars and motorcycles, then the question is, to me at least, uh, and I'm biased here, uh, is there something that already does that, that does what you want it to do? And can you just grab that from the asset store or somewhere else and not do the rest So that because you're making a game? So the real question, the first question is, are you making a game that you want to release or are you making a physics engine that you want to release or just use yourself? And I guess you don't have to release either or just making it for your own fun and game, you know, fun because that's your thing that you like doing. So are you making a game or are you making a physics engine? And then that changes the next step to me. Yeah, that's a really uh, fair point. I would probably mm-hmm. just go with an, if I were doing this, I would start with an asset and then only switch away if that wasn't going to make the job doable. If I can already use a pre-built physics system that's set up for cars and motorcycles from the asset store and it handles everything doesn't give me any issues and is going to get the job done then i'd be more than happy to use that first and then i said stick with it unless i needed to change yeah Uh, first thing i would do is sit down and go to myself (laughs) like do i need it like do i need all that physics am i going to just do it with something basic like a cube on a track or something like that like Am I going to need to have all these really high of his? I mean, am I doing an off-roading thing where I've just driven up to the forest and now I'm deflating my tires? So I've got out of my truck, I'm deflating all the tires, I've just about to boost some off-road, and now I've finished and now I'm coming back on, I'm reinflating my tires. Are we going to go to that sort of extent? Or am I just going, right, I just want to hit these and just bounce about all over the place because it's super fun? Uh, either which way. So the first step, yes, yeah, because it, it, it's asking about designing. What's your game? Like now decide do you need to have all that and if you do need to have all that yeah there's lots of asset store stuff um i do want to touch on if you actually do need the physics engine and that's a fact and you're absolutely sure there's nothing that's going to say well no you don't need that uh, to make to make your own then in making your own in technical design Something you should care about that Jason's story touched on is that being able to repeat things is very valuable Mm. for debugging purposes, by which I mean determinism of the engine is going to be a very big boon if you can manage to do that. So that's a crucial design decision. Is your physics engine deterministic or not? Um, Usually that relies on having a fixed time step. So the deltas um, for the calculations will always be consistent and That can run into a lot of problems for if you have uh, too many things and you can't make the delta for the time. Uh, Do you allow for slowdowns or do you start taking shortcuts? And can you, et cetera, et cetera. So make your choices, but determinism will help you debug crazy situations in your physics engines that you must have uh, (laughs) more easily. And keep in mind, stuff that you don't even think about outside your control will affect this like floating point numbers. You may think you're doing the same thing twice, but 
numbers can round differently in different contexts and you might find yourself losing numbers that you think were there and all of a sudden getting very frustrated why it's not exactly the same. Yeah, and that also varies between devices, which is the worst because it can be the same type of uh, platform, Android and Android, but the different device will suddenly give you different results for the same calculation. And if you need perfect replication uh, between those devices, for example, multiplayer, and that's uh, a competitive game where these things matter, you're screwed. <laughs> You guys want to jump um, on to some code-related questions? There's we got a couple about state machines, and then there's another one about architecture right after this. But I, I don't know how often you guys work with state machines or make new state machines. This question comes up all the time, though. I think everybody you know, throughout their career decides that they need to use state machines for something and then tries to figure out how to use them, how to get them to work, and, and what the best options are. So this question was really generic, just wondering for a way to code a state machine that's not tedious, so some way to make a good state machine. Do you guys have some good examples, references, ideas, thoughts on this? Well, I think someone should at least outline it first, right? Before we, before we start describing the code, someone should explain what it is and what its use cases are for. Oh, definitely, yeah. Well volunteered. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God damn! What is it? Someone good. Someone highlight somewhere. Oh, hey! <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, so I, I guess if we're doing this, we'll we'll talk about the idea that before we talk about state machines, let's talk about state. And it kind of gets muddied up as state machines as a particular pattern or structure or some complicated thing, uh, and often in the in the context of AI. But forget about all of that and simplify it down to state is just what is the state of something? How, how is it now? And it could be in a different state if you took a snapshot and said, compare the two, is the state different? That's all that state is. So I like to talk about state initially as something like a light switch. It's on or off. You don't think of a light switch having AI or being intelligent, but it's, it is state driven. It has a state. It's either in the on state or the off state. If you wanted to make a smart light, you could hook something up to it, which had a wire across a door, and if someone walks into the wire, it could toggle the state. Now, the this light switch seems smart because it's making its own decisions. There's an external thing that leads to it taking inputs, and those inputs alter the internal state. So at a very basic level, whether it's a door sensor or whether it's an app that's remote or something, all of this stuff is just decisions being made about changing states. So you inspect the current state, you make some decisions, you switch to the new state. So a state machine is no more complicated than the concept of taking in things based on some rules or conditions you change to other states. And then once you're in that state, it might react differently. The classic one being a phone. If a phone has the hanger, like well, I was going to say hanger from the old style, but I guess we'll, we'll go for more mo modern ones. If you're in a call and your phone receives a call, the current state being in a call, it will react differently than if your phone is you know, in silent and you receive a call or your phone is idle and receives a call. You basically have a state, you have some input and it will react based on the state it's in, which might change it to another state. So before we get to the designs of different kinds of state machines, don't forget that all of the code is just different ways to structure the exact same principle, which is there are discrete states. A phone is either in a call, it's idle, or it's not accepting calls. And then based on a state, you will then switch to other states based on some external thing. And everyone will have a different approach for how you get there. But that's what we're talking about. So, so that's state machines kind of in a nutshell. They, they hold some data about a thing, a way a thing is, and then adjust or change to a different state as that data changes based on external stimuli, right? So you said, like I said, reading from a sensor or reading from like a AI or NPCs around or a collision impact or whatever, something causes that state to change. And here the question was about um, state machines that are not tedious to code, which leads me to believe that they're coding some very tedious, um, probably very hard coded, you know, everything's in an if statement or a case or a switch or something. But I'm very curious. I mean, I'm kind of curious to see what their actual system looks like. That's my guess, though. What do you guys recommend um, for a good alternative or a couple options? I mean, like you said, there are different ways to do it. And sometimes the right way is going to depend on 
the problem that you're trying to solve. So you guys have some suggestions for ways to make state machines that work really well? So the, the trap in here is when you hear the term state machine and you look at the examples that everybody gives you, usually they would be like fully featured and fully bloated. Like you look at Unity's state machine, the animator and its controller, and there are so many things there that you definitely don't think you need. And the visual presentation and the uh, transitions with durations and exit points and all that. And when you get down to it, if you need something, usually the pattern forms because you solved something, you extracted it out, and then you see, oh, that's the pattern. And if we are talking about states, one thing I wanted to kind of touch on uh, while Jason was talking is that you don't necessarily need the state to act. It just need to, it needs to present. An on or off switch can be just that the switch ha is put up or put down. It's the presentation that says something is different in the two scenarios that could exist. And in, in, in the simplest form, a class representing a state, say a state, an empty class, can be all you need. And then a state machine would just let you set a current state because that's what it does, right? A state machine will have a state and something can change it. And then you just write a code that says, well, I'm within that state. Uh, under these circumstances, make the machine choose another state. Done. <laughs> it's like, it can be done under 10 lines of code, probably. Yeah, a simple one. Yeah. I think that's that's kind of how I like to start them, too. I start it really simple with the state machine and then grow it as it's needed you know if i'm going to end up with like two states or three states and i know i'm not going to need more i'm just going to keep it as simple as possible if it's going to grow into something that's going to get complex then i start expanding it out and looking at some other options um you know, i get and, into like some complex ai or something where i need to control you know, things that it's going to get harder to do just in code where i actually want to be able to have some external control what about um you dave do you do much state machine development at all like is this uh a... yeah so i i wrote my own version of the animator <laughs> as a tool as a tool uh to have nodes and transitions between nodes and then i use that for both gameplay state and for ais so it's an abstracted thing that i think everybody's talking about here you know it's just a basic state class and i have points that you could say right okay this happened and it transitions between those two things and those transitions have actions that can happen as well so yeah i built a tool set that i call the node controller which i really should have called a state machine controller but for some reason i was really onto nodes at that point <laughs> um so I, I called it a node controller i'm now regretting every decision i've ever made um so yeah i created that and i use that for both Game control, so my game is waiting, my game is running, my game is playing, my game is paused, my game is da 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 It has things. And when you look at it, it works like the animator. Nodes highlight and say you're in this state for debugging and all the rest. And then sometimes I use it for AI, but not all AI. Like Again, I think somebody put, pitched on this just now. You don't need a state machine for every uh, type of AI you can have and all the rest. But yeah, if I'm doing things like I've got an FPS game on one of the videos, uh, uh, the prototype, and the AI comes out, it looks at you and says, are you holding a gun? Right, I'm going to attack you. Oh, you're not holding a gun. I'm going to try and capture you. Uh, so it does things like that, and that's using a state machine system that comes in. But yeah. Um, I do want to touch on this because you said not all the code needs to be in state machine. That People will fall into this trap a lot, and the simplest way to get out of it is just thinking about a person existing, and here's a hand. It is raised up right now. I can still talk. I can still breathe. All these other systems keep running. The person isn't defined by their state of the specific thing they have. So don't uh, be coerced into putting everything on your state machine. And also, states can be as simple as just turning things on or off as soon as they're entered and exited. And that will let you do a lot. Uh, one thing in Terraria, um, where we have more than 600 NPCs, is that there's a method called AI. And it will run any arbitrary code. But we have a specific number there that represents state. 
and then we put if checks for if in this state do that, if in that state do that. But there is code that will run outside of all of these states, regardless of what state you're in. And sometimes we will say, well, this code will now only run under these specific states, but it's not part of the state machine. It's just turning on or off, depending on if you're in certain states. And just to and put out it, somebody's... Oh, sorry. Yeah, and, and I just want to say that in the components uh, of Unity, it's very easy to implement that. So don't be afraid of trying to do it. Hmm. And just to put out, somebody asked if I was using the animator for my state machine. No, animator I use for the animations. I have my own state machine editor uh, for building AI, and it's abstracted for AI, and it's abstracted for the game flow. I don't use yeah, the animator so, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that would be overkill in a lot of cases. A and a also, <laughs> yeah, just a lot of, not suited for a lot of cases. I, I would say, though, to, to answer more clinically about how you might actually use one, well, for, for before I before I say my solutions, I just want to highlight one thing first, which is um, a common issue I see with people designing state machines is they make the state machine a first class citizen of what they're doing. And what I mean by that is you have systems where you can take a thing like a door and say door dot state equals open. You should not be designing your system so that you directly alter the states of things. You should be providing stimulus, which changes states. Because the point of a state is internally something does or changes relative to what's incoming. For example, you might be hungry. You don't directly change the fact that you're hungry. You provide food, which internally changes the state and puts you into a full or not as a result, whether it's Chinese food or not. So, th so you basically have to switch yourself based on the inputs that are coming in. So that's one. States are internally how a system changes relative to the inputs it's receiving. So that'll make your code simpler if you don't try to expose states as some external third-party thing. As for how you actually write it, it can literally be something as simple as you start out with a Boolean, you write an if statement, and you update loot tube an if statement. Then later on, it'll get more complicated. You'll realize it's not a binary state. You might switch to an enum. And by definition, a state machine type is called a finite state machine, which is limited sets of states. In that case, because I normally rail against using enums incorrectly, but in this case, an enum, which is literally defining a finite set of states, is a viable option for a finite state machine. And then you switch on those, and in your switch statement, you use different things for that. Then your project might grow larger, and that's probably not enough to contain a giant switch statement. Sometimes I like to use a dictionary, of actions mapped to a enum. And so now I would build the action map effectively, and then I would run the current state based on the contents of the dictionary. Then if that's not working for what I need and the project grows larger in requirements, you might need to have the states actually do their own logic, in which case you will have a dedicated state class. That's what we were describing earlier. And that's where the object itself internally has a state. And without going too down this whole rabbit hole, the idea would be if you had a bank account, a state could be overdrawn, um, locked, has balance, or whatever. And what happens is if you try to call bank account dot deposit internally, it'll call the current state dot deposit. And if current state is overdrawn, it will display a message saying I can't do that. If current state is account is in good standing, it might perform the action. So there's no if statement check there is something has occurred, the object state has changed, and you defer that to the object state. And depending on those actions, it'll switch the object state. That tends to be the most sort of default implementation, um, but I don't start there. And I'm very, very clear about that. You start with the if statement, you work your way down. Oftentimes, you don't need that complexity. Sometimes you'll see people do a, a generic state machine, which takes type T and build objects, and that's fine. Uh, I'll probably do that myself later on for things, but I don't start that way. Don't immediately throw in a giant state machine when realistically an if statement will do. So a state machine, don't think of it as a system. Think of it as a solution to a problem. If you don't have that problem, don't use that solution. So you don't jump to the biggest, the hardest solution first? Hardest? <laughs> <The> most complex. <laughs> um, I, I guess real quick before, I want to know a little bit more about Dave's solution, but I was curious about Andrew. Do you use state machines or visual state machines or anything very often in your current game work that you're doing? Um, I, I, I might use them incorrectly or yes, I certainly use them. 
whether I use them in a well-defined manner that we've been talking about or whether I'm still learning about how I use them correctly and well-defined, et cetera, uh, absolutely not. Um, but I think you know one of the things that came up in my mind with the, the Legend of the Stones, the game I'm working on, is, is really about the enemy AI. And somebody in the, in the, in the um, chat mentioned enemy AI. And you know for that type of thing, enemy AI, there's a various number of components that, that go into it. For for my game, there's you know one overall state of are you turn-based combat or real-time combat? You can switch between the two, and how the enemy acts is gonna change based on that. You know, in real time they're gonna walk on a nav mesh and they're gonna walk like this, they're gonna attack based on their time, etc. On turn base, it's very different, you know. Um, so there's that. But then there's also is the enemy um, you know in the attack zone are they in the range attack zone are in the the follow zone then the other things like can they hear can they see the player um and if they can't did they see them are they in a search pattern like they saw the player before they can't see them now so where are they doing in that state so there are a lot of these states that kind of i don't know bubble up on top of each other and i think you're right. Your your example of you know the hands up, but the rest does the rest. Uh, it can still do things. Is I think the good example of what I've been trying to to achieve. Yes, the enemy is in seek mode. They they saw the player somewhere. They're searching for them. They can still attack. They can still do all these other things. But then let's say they get further away away from their home base, and they're now they're in their retreat mode because they went too far, and I don't want them going too far from their zone. So now this that state changes from C, it, it's just it gets complicated, but it gets more simple, I think, for me when I think about each one of these as its own little mini state that drives behavior and they just kind of work together to form what seems very complex, but really it's just a bunch of very simple states, you know, that have just a few options and and maybe a hierarchy of importance in the end just makes it appear intelligent and and, and complex yeah <laughs> and, complexity and, and this, out of a bunch of simple stuff this comes yeah. back to what i was saying earlier and i really do mean this I, I think a lot of people miss this point sometimes people will solve this problem with nested substate machines which works you can have a state machine where the state has substates and depending on how complex things are that can work but if you take something like i, I did in a project a vending machine which had a battery on the side you could take the battery out or plug it in um you can have the concept of something that provides power and that can have its own internal state of, is it on? Is it broken? Is it providing power? And then you can have a vending machine, which is it vending? Is there stuff in it and whatever? And you don't have to actually have the two things really know about each other, which is why I was very clear in saying state should be internal. The state of the battery is whether or not it's doing the battery's job. But the vending machine is only checking if it has a battery or not, and it changes its state accordingly. And so you don't need to have this super complicated nest of hierarchical multi-part states. You just have things which interact with each other and states should be internal to the objects and only react from that IO concept of how it interacts with the next system. And to clarify, you mean that you'll have um, something that provides power and is providing power. It has an internal state of yeah, broken yeah. on. Yeah. But in well, the yeah. end, you're not asking it what the current state is. You're asking, is it providing power, which is the exactly. abstraction here. And what it might mean is like, if you look at the world, everything has states. You're not thinking about it, yeah. but the door is closed or open. The light is on or off. The monitor is on or off. The, you know, whether you're, whether something has, is the lights are displaying or not displaying. These are all states and you don't have to make some God tier 50 state thing. You can just have discrete elements. And then later on other patterns, you can do things like facade patterns, which will take complicated concepts and say, is in party mode or not, could be a constituent set of setting tons of sub-state machines. You don't need to make a dedicated state for every possible thing. You see this in some games where they have things like swimming and weapons equipped and whatever. You don't need to have dedicated sub-states for swimming while holding an axe, but also has a hat on, right? You can have this nested things and the states are the composites of what happens when these other things are put together. Dave, you'd mentioned that you built your own system, and we talked a little bit about the different code systems. I'm just curious, like, what is that? Can you just give a real brief overview of what that system code looks like? Is it like a generic abstracted state class? 
with some stuff going on there or like what is the just general overview of that yeah i mean you've got the editor side of things and you've got the the actual workings of the thing and they're abstracted away from each other you know i I talk about things highlighting when it's debugging and all the rest of it that's that's purely an editor side of thing that doesn't touch any of the the real code as uh, well except for literally the code saying i'm in this and it being able to flow it but yeah it's an abstracted thing from an editor standpoint but everything else has its own sort of state structure. Um, and as story says, you don't have to have that for everything. Uh, right. These state machines that I write are not massively big bundled things that you often see in the animator as well when people build animators. They have this giant thing that's going on. Uh, but no, a lot of it's more Everyone's- simpler. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of it's more more simple. Um, the, the enemy walks in and it's in a searching mode and then that searching mode has some transitions that says oh i found something you know i've done this i i'm getting shot i i need to go in and then it's like i'm getting shot and that transitions to right you got shot what the hell is he going to do well he's a brute he's just going to take it and he's just going to run faster at the enemy oh no he's actually going to go and freaking hide so now i'm going to go and find a hiding spot oh there's no hiding spot ah, okay right what am i going to do now well i'm going to turn to a brute mode i'm just going to go at the enemy or i'm just going to take it lie down and die um, yeah, like, like that's yeah. a good example. Like if you're talking about attacking, you might have a state for in a, in an aggressive or attack state. You might not need to have a long range attack state and a close range attack <laughs> state. You simply have an attack state, and yep. inside of that attack state, current weapon use right, and that current weapon will dictate how the attack state sort of manifests itself. But you don't need to start going into this microcosm of every conceivable sub portion of it. No, because if you did, as, as stories already said, you, you end up with just such a ridiculous state machine that you've got to then manage and build for every single one of your enemies. It's just, no. Can you use a bow while you're swimming? Right. I can. No, because you're in water. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a magic bow, then it's fine. Okay, of course it's a magic bow. They're all magic. <laughs> After level one. So I think we should probably hit the next question, which... I think really leans into a lot of the things we were talking about already, which is about when you're starting out a new project and you're trying to figure out how you're going to put that project together. It says you're beginning a new project. How do you think about the architecture of your code design patterns and et cetera? And there's a little bit I had to cut out for keeping it short, but it says, is this the type of thing that you think about more later after the project's developed a bit, or is this something that you kind of pre-plan out in advance like how much of it do you plan out do you go like i'm going to write out all my classes i'm going to write out everything do you like have a over overarching design idea or like, where's the level for you guys i assume it's going to vary uh-huh. for each person here but i'm kind of curious like well, where is it for you guys like if you're starting a new project tomorrow what are you going to do or maybe you just recently started one what did you do start writing the code that you need and then uh, extract it to the pieces that you need and see, oh, look, I have patterns now. And, oh, look, there's architecture now. And, oh, this is awesome. Yay. Seriously, though, you don't you don't design these things up front unless there's a very specific thing that you already know that you fully need in a specific way. And then you can just implement that. But it's not going to be everything and it's definitely not going to be your architecture. It's just going to be a simple implementation of one thing of a specific pattern that you already know that's a common solution to a known problem that you have. <laughs> At least on my end. No, you, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I, I tend to like that explanation too because I've personally... In the past, and I, this may be kind of related to that, what we were talking about earlier with the planning and the, the Trello boards and stuff, I have definitely fallen into the hole of like, I'm going to architect out this entire project. Now, one time it made sense because I was trying to architect for an actual problem of scale. Like there was a scale problem and it was literally just trying to architect around that. The rest of it wasn't in there. But outside of that, usually what I found is that I would try to architect things as a placeholder for getting work done and a placeholder for actually like jumping in and accomplishing things. I mean, doing all of this planning and then start, of course, anybody want to share what the problem is with when you start to plan all this shit on paper and in Trello boards, and then you try to code it. I don't even want to spoil it myself. Well, who knows what happens to you guys when you do that? 
I, I think the, the best version of this I actually heard was from Chris. Um, basically, so the idea is that before we get to um, architecture, let's just think of planning in general. So whenever you're doing any kind of planning, one type of planning is estimation. Someone says, how long will it take you to make this thing? So there's two kinds of scenarios here. You've done it before, so you have a good idea of how long it will take. And realistically, if you've done it before, as a programmer, you're probably automating some part of that task. So you know how to do it, and it's also partially automated. Or you've never done it before, and so all you're making is a hilariously wild guess. Because you literally have never done it before, and so you have no idea how long it's going to take. And so you're arbitrarily just piecing together random hopes and dreams and hoping you're vaguely correct. And so architecture, to me, is no different. It's like saying, I'm building a house. And so what we'll do is we'll put the ground down. We'll just throw a load of walls in different places and we'll figure it out later because we kind of, we need walls. We'll just put some walls in and hope they're the right walls later. And all that means is when you start trying to work in the space you've built, you're now climbing around walls that you place down relatively arbitrarily with no understanding of what the problem was. And so everything slows down. You start making a mess of your code. You don't know what you're doing. And you start feeling guilty that your systems aren't matching the code you're writing. And so you start writing to try to conform to the shape of the code of the architecture rather than actually solving the problems you really have and your code gets twice as bad. So in general, exactly as you said, I start with what is the problem I'm solving? What is the least amount of code I need to solve that problem? And then I write that and then I look at it and I go, that's fine. And I do it again. And by two or three times, I'm like, okay, now it's a bit messy. Now I need to stop. And if I keep stacking on top of this, it's a house of cards, it'll fall over. But now that I've got two or three things, I can stop and tidy some edges and move the things around and make it more stable. Then I stack two or three more things. Pause, do the same again, and keep iterating. And then when I'm done, I step back, look at what I've got, and go, oh, that's what the architecture for this system is. It's not what I guessed or wrote down. It's what happens when you solve problems successfully in succession. And some of it comes from experience as well. You've, you've coded several projects, you know how to code them. Sometimes you will start doing things a little bit automatically, like putting in some patterns because you just know. I've done I this will admit I do before. that. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. Or you have, like me, you have a library of things that you use. You just pull in the library and you're just like, that's got it all set up and nicely done and already gone. Um, but. It, some people shouldn't worry if you start if you're just starting out coding oh. and all the rest of it you 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 know you might not get that like state uh, machine or design pattern or anything straight away uh, but go on your you are jumping i i wanted to say that usually what i i think i can uh i think you'll be able to agree with is that what you're doing is uh going to be only touched from a single point and usually that's because uh you already know the system is going to be to be expanded to that so you already have the entire abstraction in your head of the interface, quote unquote, that you'll be using there. Yeah, and that's, that just comes from experience. Yeah. And if yeah. you're just starting out, you will get that as you go on, but make those mistakes because you'll learn from and, those mistakes on why you need to use that pattern and all the rest of it. It doesn't hurt and, to make those mistakes. Don't feel bad about it. Yeah, and if you're not confident in what you're doing, it's best to just plug it into a single point that you can access because then it will be easy to swap later. And I will Isolate. say, I'll even fight myself on that too, is I will I will start writing something and I'll go, okay, I've done this a million times. That's a factory. That's going to need a state machine. I'll need this. And when I'm about to write it, I will stop myself and say, I've made a pretty confident assertion there. I will go back and I'll actively not write the thing I think I want to so that I will force myself into a design to see if I was right. Because sometimes you'll make an assumption like that and come back and go, oh, it could have been done in two lines of code. But my brain went straight to a state machine because that's what you do when you've got a toolbox full of fancy toys you've been using for years and you kind of know how they work. So I will often, even writing big systems, force myself to start as if I'm starting from scratch. And if five or 10 lines in, I'm like, no, oh, no, this is turning into a state machine. I'll take the real one now. Yeah. I'll take the one I have. But I will try not to go jump to that assumption. You don't want to do kitchen sink design. You want to start clean and work your way up. Great advice. And just delete it if you make the wrong decision. Go back and, and undo it and change it. Yeah, so, version control. Uh, nothing's going to break. <laughs> yeah. Funnily <laughs> enough, I, I when I first started out programming at IF University, I was doing um, radar systems. And um, before you're allowed to write a line of code, you have to design the entire thing in UML. Uh, oh, 
just I've I've worked places like that. <sighs> wanted a oh. class design. I've worked at places where they wanted um full documentation on yep. every method of the class, like a full before you code a thing yep. of what the method does. That's funny. I haven't used are, useless yeah. modeling language in a while. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I was so glad when I didn't have to do that anymore. But you you had to write everything like what every function was going to do, what everything was going to connect to before you wrote one line of code. And I'd just come out of university, and I was I was like, is this, is this what engineering really is? And then I just went to video games and didn't ever have to do those again. The only thing I can think of that would legitimize this is the legacy of you couldn't actually build and run in five seconds. And that would actually imply that you're going to have to do a lot of complex things just to see that it works. So theoretically, you had to make sure it all works before you even made it in actual code. I think a lot but of I will it, say, I will put my foot down. If I'm managing a team, my one concession close to that will be if there's two separate parts of a team working in parallel, I will force both <laughs> sides not to make a UML, but to make an interface contract of what they assume it will look like. Now, it's okay if it changes, but I want both sides to be able to mock the interaction so they can continue doing their jobs with a relatively safe assumption. So I do want enough understanding that if you are making a black box, you're telling me what the IO is going to be. But yeah, I don't need to know the what you assume the class interactions are going to be because that's stupid. That's like modeling. So again, you haven't designed it. You haven't used it yet. You have no idea what you're designing. You're just guessing. You make sure that both teams' services have a discrete, this is what they're serving. Mm -hmm. a yep. clean what they're serving yeah yeah i wish it was just that though and it wasn't it was horrible yeah I th don't go I, work for the government <laughs> i think that those those documentation requirements a lot of them at least in my experience they were at hardware companies that mm -hmm. and they kind of stem from that process of it kind of what you are I was saying you can't with hardware you can't do you know an instant build test and hook it all up and you got cost of burning up things like chip that i caught on fire right so they probably just have that kind of built into their brains and then it gets pushed around through management and becomes some arbitrary rule that everybody hates and doesn't really help so i, I want to hit another question got Go really ahead, good to make i was i was gonna say i got really good at making really clean tidy design friendly looking umls though it was really pretty <laughs> horrible but really pretty Anyway, another, sorry, carry on. another great skill you'll probably never use again. <laughs> never going to use that again. Except sorry. when showing people why I don't like it. And actually, <laughs> honestly, I don't. One thing that I think really proves to me how useless UML are is you've got a ton of programming books out there, like the, the famous Gang of Four Design Patterns book, and every single one of them is annotated with a, with a UML diagram. And it's gibberish. Nobody knows how to read the damn thing. It might as well be hieroglyphics. It's like... I've said this many times. If you're if you're a programmer, talk to programmers like programmers using the language you universally speak, code. Don't make an abstracted concept. Draw that. Come up with a new language of different hieroglyphics for that, and then try to teach each other, and then talk through this one rather than just use the bloody code that you both speak to describe the thing that you're talking about. Don't listen to Jason. Just hate circles, diamonds, and whatever squiggly lines are in. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta give diamonds, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you guys ready to answer a question about dependency injection? So this is really just a a not so much a technical one, but a question on your thoughts. What are your thoughts on using dependency injection in conjunction with interface segregation in the place of static instance singleton pattern? So how do you guys feel about dependency injection in general? And anybody Real quickly, just want to give like a, a three-liner on what dependency injection is for people who might not know that are with us right now. Yeah, so um, you have something and it's going to need other things in order to work. For example, um, a shooter character needs a gun in order to shoot in a regular shooting game. So you, uh, the concept of de dependency injection is the gun and the shooter are separate the shooter needs the gun somehow, and dependency injection means it comes uh, somehow. It has to resolve that dependency. So the, there the are two types. The player told of, what the gun is by something, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are two types of dependency injection: internal and external. And the internal is the player says, "Well, I need a gun. I'm making a gun. I have a gun now." External would be, 
I'm getting the gun from outside and this is the dependency injection. Something gives the shooter a gun in order to do whatever it needs to do. Right. And it's kind of, yeah, and, and, and in that you mean it's giving it like in advance before it's used. It's So the difference yeah. here is like you wouldn't have the player searching for the gun or finding the gun or using the singleton instance of it. Something is passing the player saying, hey, player, here's here's your gun. Maybe it's in the constructor. Maybe it's somewhere else along the initialization path. Um, but somehow it's getting past the gun and then the player is using that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's worth noting, though, that there's there's multiple steps to this kind of if we're reasoning this out. The first step is called dependency resolving or dependency resolution. It's it's the idea that just, just like you were describing, I am a thing, I need other things. I am a player, I need a gun. That's like, how do you resolve that problem? And the usual is is a or has a. So you either make the thing what it needs to be, so a player is a gun, or you say a player has a gun. If a player has a gun, it has to get a gun. And then the way you solve that is either you have it make it itself internally, which is what we're describing, or you provide a dependency. And then the classic way to do that is a constructor, which you can't do in Unity for various reasons. That's not a, that's a different conversation. Uh, but uh, what I want to make clear here is that the solution, first of all, is dependency inversion. So the idea is that rather than having the thing make it, where you could say person and gun you're saying that the, this depends on this, so the person needs to know that a gun exists to make it, you can invert that dependency by saying person receives weapon. Now, person doesn't actually need to know about gun at all. They need to know about the concept of weapon, and a gun can be given to them, and they don't know. They just use whatever the thing that they've been given. So step one is dependency inversion. You make your classes support the concept of being given things rather than it making the things itself. Then dependency injection is a way to resolve those dependencies. It's a separate thing. It's where you have an environment. All of your scripts are now dependency inverted, and you take those dependency inverted scripts, and then you run, or you, you basically make a kernel which constructs your application by injecting the various dependencies. And the reason you inject dependencies is because dependencies are going to have a chain of requirements. So you might say a game requires a player, and a player requires a weapon. And so to resolve those dependencies, you would have to build this really weird chain of create weapon, give weapon to player, create player, give player to world, create world, give world to game system, and it starts to get hard to resolve. And so what you do is you use a dependency injection system. A dependency injection lets you start at the root and say, whenever a weapon is asked for, give it this one. Whenever a player is asked for, give it this one. Whenever someone says, I want to talk to the high score system, give it the Steam library high score system. Whenever they want to save, use this saving library. And then you basically say resolve. And resolve will walk all the chains and fill in all the gaps and provide everything it needs to, to do that. Um, so there's a fundamental difference between dependency resolving, dependency inversion, and dependency injection. And that gets you to what all of those are. And the reason that matters is because the, the real question here for people who are confused why there's a relationship between singleton and dependency injection in the question is a singleton is a way of resolving dependencies. It's a way of saying, how do I give this, this? And the way you do that in a singleton manner is to say, I am a person, I need a gun, there is one gun in the world, and they can say gun.this or gun.instance if we're being particular. And that's a singleton. It's saying there is only one of these things. In that example, doesn't make sense for a gun, might make sense for a high score system. If your game has a high score system it talks to and the player kills an enemy, and so enemy dies and the score happens, you could try to resolve that dependency by just saying high score dot instance dot add score on death of a character. And that works and you're binding those two things together. And that's what the dependency is. But dependency inversion would mean you pass in a high score system. And so you could have different enemies use different high score systems. And then dependency injection would automate that process for you. So that's that's the whole process of why they're there. And the answer and is what our thoughts are. Me personally... I think it's too much for most games. I think dependency injection as a solution works for service-oriented applications. Games, Singleton does 90% of the cases. Um, so I, I do want to touch on some things. It's about dependency injection in the pure concept and not the, the, the whole dependency injection system, mega systems that are out there. So there are times where it's nice to have, for example, a player has weapons, give the player weapons, player uses weapons, common case in games. 
not the problem there. The reason we talked about dependency um, inversion is because interface segregation is closely tied to that because you abstract the dependency into a thing, which an interface is ex doing exactly that. It's making a contract. This is something that fulfills the contract. It does a thing. So instead of saying a, a ship needs um, a motor to work, a ship needs something that moves it, then here is something that moves it. And uh, this is basically the interface segregation part for those who didn't know. Um, and there you have so something my, like an iMover or something that they're all implementing and you're kind yeah. of resolving that depending on. Now, what would be a scenario where you would change how you're resolving that? Like as an example for people who haven't done it before. Like where where would you switch that? Like, I So there's something I want to touch on just before I answer that. Oh, and go ahead. That's, I just want to say that what, the first thought that I wanted to say here is why not both? And I know that's a bit mean, but a singleton instance, one of the big benefits of it is that it can fulfill interface contracts. You can make a singleton do whatever anything else does, and then you can pass it in, and you can also mock it because now you can make, uh, through the interface, other things that can be accepted. So, for example, if I need a music player and I need to make sure it starts and stops playing a music, and I have a music provider that's all the music tracks in the game, I can use that, which is going to be a singleton. I don't need multiples of all the musics in the game. Or I can make a mock music player and use that. So there's that. Now, as for why you use dependency injection at all um, with the interface segregation, like you asked, um, does anyone else want to answer that, or do I need a bit time to formulate my thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I can I can touch on that briefly. I I, I just want to say though, with the um, dependency inversion, um, as as one note, one one of the comments quickly is that um, someone said they don't like the inversion pattern because it's over engineered and hard to test. I agree with over engineered oftentimes, but hard to test, it's the exact opposite. You cannot get an easier system to test than something that's inverted in dependencies, because by design you can give it mockable things that dependently test. Uh, but yeah, sorry, to, to go back to the uh, specifically interface segregation. So the metaphor I use for this in particular is stolen directly out of the um, Head First Design Patterns book, which is if you have a duck, a duck can speak and a duck can move. And so your starting duck quacks when it speaks, and flaps its wings to fly, to move. Uh, but if you want, you could have a rubber duck, which squeaks, but doesn't actually move. Or you could have a rocket robot duck, which could have you know jetpack, and then maybe it roars, because why not? And the idea would be that rather than defining what a thing is, interface segregation could say, you've got multiple things that could use a jetpack, so, or multiple movement methods. So rather than solving the problem by having a duck and having to implement all forms of a duck, interface segregation would say a duck is a thing that can move and can speak, at which case you can have different methods of speaking and different methods of moving, and you can compose a duck out of multiple parts, but you could have a dog, which speaks by barking and moves by running. And it's the same structured system. But where that gets very interesting later is you could have a collection of things, whether they're people or animals or ducks or whatever and if you could say speak all speaking things can speak and you don't have to you don't have to make dedicated code to handle duck speaking versus dog speaking versus people speaking the concept is a speaker can speak and so interface segregation lets you define your system by feature sets rather than by actual elements or entities and the way i like to phrase that is an i am statement or i can so i can jump a jumper is a thing that jumps, or I I can change color is a color changer, and it can change its color, and you can compose things out of it, and then so imagine how much easier your systems would be if you say uh, anything that needs to change color can use this color changer, and suddenly you don't have to define that anymore. They all get to use the same one unless otherwise specified, uh, which gives you a lot more freedom for design. So there there is a lot of utility in doing this, but one last note I want to make on the concept here is. There's a common misconception that the singleton pattern is the idea of a static instance on an object. That is not the singleton pattern. That is a static 
class implementation of the singleton pattern. The singleton pattern simply states a thing has one instance. There are a lot of ways to get that to be true. And one case in particular is if you're using dependency injection, you have this concept of scopes. So you can actually say, in every time someone asks for a weapon, give them a new instance of weapon. But every time someone asks for a high score system, give them this exact high score system. So you have de facto made a singleton without declaring the object as a singleton because it's provided as a singleton. There's also something called transient scopes when you deal with web services because you've got operations where a person makes multiple requests and then leaves. So I guess my point with that is they're not competing because the singleton pattern is a way to choose a thing to be single instance. The most common implementation is using a non-dependency injected solution, but you can do it that way too. So they're not... They're not competing, I guess, is my point. I think it's important to note the um, prefabs, too, and how prefabs kind of play a role here. So a lot of the time, people come from like a web world, and they're used to writing up something for a dependency injection framework to tie a lot of these things together. And I think that some of the examples that you just gave, Jason, um, actually work really well as prefabs, too, using interfaces where those... Um, those interfaces are other components or implemented of other by other components on there and then grabbed and you're essentially injecting those dependencies by creating the prefab, right? You're kind of, it's a lot like the XML based dependency injection, except now you're in dot prefab dependency injection. You're kind of building up these objects in, in the same way. Well, that, that's why I'm particularly dramatic about the differences between, they're both called DI, so it can get confusing, but dependency inversion and dependency injection. Because when I'm asked a question like this, what do you think of dependency injection? My answer is, I really like dependency inversion. <laughs> I don't really like using dependency injection. And to be really clear, what I mean is, it's a good idea to architect your code such that you can provide alternate versions. I don't like having the code internally use debug.log because now for all time I have to use unity debug but if I pass in a logger I can use a version of logger that uses debug log or something else and so dependency inversion where you choose that something else provides it another version of that's called the strategy pattern doesn't matter which way you want to go about it but the thing doesn't make the decisions something else gives it the toys to play with that is a really good idea but when it comes to the actual question of dependency injection, dependency injection is a tool designed to resolve a complex hierarchy. If you've got systems which are, here's a web service which connects to a database provider, which uses a logger, which connects to this um, caching system so that the factories provide the caches from the database logs, you start to get into hairy territory of, do I, do I want to cache here? And is this going to that server? And what about the database provider? And... The reason you do that is because later on in a more complex system, you might go, you know what, we're migrating our entire backend from Azure to AWS, or um, we've decided we're switching platforms from using Steam to using some other, it's like Unreal or something, and we're not using the Steam high score system anymore. We can, in one place, in our resolved kernel, we can swap out from using, hey, whenever someone asks for a high score system, give them the Steam one. We can change one line and say bind to that interface this other high score system. And we've completely rewritten our system, which is really great for testing because you can have two different builds. You could say when running in test mode, don't use real data. When using in real mode, then use the real high score. There's a lot of utility in that when it's service oriented, when it's a system that has a lot of external services. What has a lot of external services? Applications. Applications that are very data heavy and service heavy and web services and connections and client stuff. Games. Games in general tend to not have that as much. There tends to be a couple of managers, a couple of services, but for the most part, it's entity driven. And so in general, I don't like using dependency injection if you don't need it, because it's it basically takes all of that logic out here and turns it into a constructed root, which is not very intuitive for games, which is a lot more about passing in different components and composing these complicated objects. So I think they're not mutually exclusive, but I do think dependency injection is the wrong tool for that job. It's suitable for applications and web. It's not as suitable for games. Some games that are are might work if it's very service based. If it's some like web data game, maybe turn based thing, fine. So most games I, not I, really. I can give you some very concrete examples of where you would use such things though. Platform services between say Windows, Linux, iOS, 
um, are very good examples because they have different implementations of clipboard or other window monitoring uh, things. Uh, like Jason said, the store API, store social services also change depending on your need. And they can all be a singleton. You just make a different singleton per build of the game for these different uh, social stores. And also, if you have different hardware, for example, uh, Razer versus um, Corsair keyboards, they have different implementations of their RGB. So all these kinds of services can be abstracted into something that gets made to fulfill the services, the, the contract, and then you can use that. And you don't have to care about what is it that you have right now. Yeah, but the way, the way I would specifically highlight that, though, is I agree with you. There are multiple services in that case, but I would resolve that by you don't need dependency injection. What you need is a strategy pattern slash dependency inversion, one or the other, and then you create a factory, and a factory constructs objects using the provided objects you give it. So rather than a dependency injection framework, you simply have a factory for creating X, and then you build the factory so it creates the right type of thing. So I don't disagree. I just think that a lot of people who don't understand the steps of how that build jump to the straight to the big, bad, super extendject solution. And I want to make it clear that you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the dependency inversion. You can have the injection of your dependencies. You just don't need a dependency injection framework. It's literally you can just write 10 lines of code and just manually do it. The whole point of the injection framework is to resolve complicated trees. If you're building it yourself, you don't need the complicated trees. You can just put it together. So that goes a lot. Reading resources. Yeah. So <laughs> let's. Uh, I guess. Uh, hope we'll see how bad the uh, the the flames come from the the dependency injection stuff <laughs> in, in chat and comments. Kind of curious. It, actually, if if you feel strongly about DI, drop a comment and just kind of let us know. I'm kind of curious to see. How, how strong that is. There used to be like a lot of people that would reply like, you're nuts, you should be using dependency injection for everything. And then there'd be other people arguing, no dependency injection is terrible and turn into big fights. So oh. I'm curious to see how it'll go. <laughs> um, but yeah, we had another question on most recommended reading resources. Do you guys have some uh, suggestions? I mean, we've given them out, so I figured this would be a really fast question why I wanted to pop it up. So you guys want to give your quick lists? Uh, so I do enjoy reading the Game Dev Guru uh, posts right now a lot. They very, they're very informative, at least in the Unity um, space. Um, anything that Freya Holmer makes, great source, whether it's reading on Twitter or listening to a four-hour video. <laughs> um, very informative as well especially about math and shaders, which are not as much spoken about. Uh, Cat-like coding um, is a recent good one. Official APIs are underrated. So, uh, sorry, official API documentations are underrated. Specifically They've Steams, uh, it's lately. fantastic. Yeah, I've noticed, Steams, like, by the way, was, is getting good. Yeah, Steam was great from the start. Unity's is fantastic. Just make sure you're reading the latest version of whatever it is you're reading. And make sure that if you're working with a package, read the packages documentation and not the general Unity pages. <laughs> um, anything else? <laughs> uh, that's a pretty big list already. Dave, you got anything? Yeah, I mean, I don't really read code books anymore. I've still got a ton of them sitting on my shelf upstairs from when I used to program Maya and stuff like that when when you had to get the book because the... Oh, I'm back aging in the myself. olden days. But yeah, back in the olden the days. Store and pick up yeah, a, a dead like, tree and read it. C++. I've got loads of books on C++ upstairs um, from way back in the day when I used to do a lot of C++ programming. I don't really that was my first programming book was like a C++ book and I was so yeah. lost. Like a teenager trying to read through it. Like I have no idea what most of this means. It seems to work, but I don't know what any of it means yet. <laughs> like trying to figure it all out. Yeah, I mean today, obviously, yeah, the Unity releases and all the rest of it, I read all that. Um, but a lot of times I spend more time watching like tutorials from people. Uh, some of the stuff that comes up on Kitbash, which is a... Uh, to bring Andrew into some of this because Kitbash do um, 3D models and stuff like that. They have concept artists coming in a lot and 
demonstrate how they perform concepts and and build all that stuff i love watching that thing and then i'll go to that concept artist and read their blogs and and look at what their inspiration is and all the rest of that but that's for for general um larger stuff but no i don't really i mean i i read fantasy books and stuff like that but i don't have a lot of books that i go to uh, as far as that stuff but yeah any good fantasy books like, you recommend uh ready player one okay uh <laughs> yeah sorry i know we're gonna get some hate um, for that but yeah ready player one um i'm holding my tongue on that one yeah i thought some people might hold their tongue on that one um yeah, vr kid boy uh, yeah i'm trying to think of other resources that i go to uh but i don't really have anything uh, i, I think your, your youtube channel should be one of them maybe you make a video on all your yeah, yeah, reading though i don't watch that <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta oh. watch your own youtube channel no, I, I watch it once just I'm to I'm going to come sure over to your house and just sit there playing you a, on video the whole time. Oh, my mic's gone off halfway through a 30-minute capture, which <laughs> kills me. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, come back to me. I'm sure Jason's story has like a, a list of books. Well, first, let's see, if Andrew, you got any? Yeah, I don't don't have Andrew first. <laughs> um, my, my, my MO is really just to Google the questions and see what comes up. I, I, a lot of, you know, what you're right, what you've said, I've seen those blogs. I've seen those YouTube channels and YouTube is, is, is a big one for me. Um, there are some, and I probably should, I, I think I subscribe to them when I think about it, but I should probably like do a better job of bookmarking and subscribing. But there are some, uh, YouTubers out there who do a really good job of explaining plus also showing their code so that if I want to just see their code and be like, Oh, I get it now. I can, I can do that. So there, there's a variety there, but really it's just, you know, um, finding, uh, sort of a, an innate ability to know which links on the Google results are going to be the good ones and which ones aren't based on the small bit of preview text and titles that they show you. And then I find myself of course, seeing the same post over and over. Like whenever I search anything about link, Jason Wyman, your post on link comes up number one. Every single time. And about half the time, it's what I needed. You know, in the other half, I'm like, nope, he didn't talk about it. I need to need to keep searching. But that's what I do. Nice, nice. So um, I'll give mine real quick and then we'll jump into, I assume Jason's got a bookshelf full of reading resources right behind. Uh, generally, I'm kind of like Dave. I don't read too many code books anymore. Code Complete and Clean Code were still, I think, really good books. Not super relevant if you're a game programmer, but... They're really good on some just core lessons on not writing shitty code. It's just kind of like you read it and it says, hey, you know, like write code that doesn't suck because you're going to look at it again. Uh, outside of that, a game programming patterns book is pretty good. It gets physical copy and you can read it online completely free. It's just game programming book doc, no game design patterns dot com. So that's what it is. The game design patterns book. That's, that's the one. one I'm trying to get my words out right. And then, um, yeah, I also like uh, Game Dev Guru stuff. Your, your, I had mentioned that. So I actually got his stuff bundled with my courses right now. It's really cool. He's got just good, really good um, just tips and optimization stuff. So I, I check that out as well. Um, uh, mainly, though, for me, when it comes to reading, I spend most of my time reading or listening to books on productivity and getting shit done instead of on code. Is the kind of thing that I can just like listen to, get some ideas for, get some like um, some habits and systems for that I can kind of pull out of these books and then try to use them to be more productive, get more stuff done. And just, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. That's kind of the focus. That and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Highly recommend the book. Read it a couple times, listen to it a couple times. It'll give you some good advice on how not to be a dick. <laughs> it's really, really, really good advice, and it'll help you in life too. Just James, like, oh, never put that <laughs> down. <laughs> Don't bother picking it up; just be a dick. Um... <laughs> All right, Jason, you want to bust out the book? <laughs> oh boy! Right. It's like, oh, um, let me move out of the way. <laughs> so, I was thinking about this as, as everyone was giving theirs, and I'm actually going to approach this differently than my usual one which is, I'm going to acknowledge, I think, Andrew click kind of hit the nail on the head with this, in that oftentimes I'll just give people books that I liked or books that I think are helpful. But when you have a vague question like this, 
like, do you want books on AI? Do you want books on project management? There's, there's so much resources that my answer, you know, read everything is not very compelling. I think what's a more valuable thing to do is talk about the process for finding good resources, because that's going to be more useful to you. Um, so as, as Andrew said, uh, I also start with Google. And Google Foo is a skill in and of itself. And if you want the first thing to learn to recommend reading resources, I'm not kidding, Google, Google Foo. <laughs> Google Foo is the universal name for learning how to use Google tools effectively. And it'll teach you how to use the filtering tools, how to search for types of items, to, to know some of the cheeky tricks for getting uh, PDFs of some very expensive programming books off college servers. It's their fault if they leave them open. There's lots of stuff you can do. Um, and so learning how to Google correctly is step one. And then the other thing is learning how to ask the right questions. And a common mistake I see is people will Google for half the answer. So if you're programming and you know you're doing something with rigid bodies and they're not working correctly and you're getting glitched collisions of something, you might be tempted to write, why are my rigid bodies not working correct?" or something like that. And you're going to get weirdly you, you get less results than you think. But if you write unity, why is physics not working as horribly vague and pointless of a statement as that seems, you're hitting more of an average search of what people are going to search for. So when you're trying to solve a problem, don't write, how do I use Raycast to blank? Write, how do I shoot a gun? Or how do I open door? And what you'll find is more adequate resources for what you're searching. So step one, Google Foo, learn it, very, very useful. Two, build yourself a knowledge base. Um, it's up to you how you do this. I've recently moved to Obsidian for most of mine, but I used to use one of 100 different apps in the past. Effectively, if you find a link that's good, keep it. Your memory isn't great, and you're certainly not going to remember URLs. And oftentimes, if you've picked up something once, as everyone here will attest to, you'll remember you've read something useful about this one time last year on some website, and you can't remember the link. And you can go back and research again and go through that process or you can write it down once, give it a tag of some kind like Unity, Platformer, whatever. There's a particular Dave Tech link uh, to platformers I link a lot and I always forget what the link is. So writing in my little notebook, Platformer, Unity, 2D, whatever, I'll eventually find it when I search my own little mini Wikipedia. Um, so learn how to Google, keep your links when you find them, and then... If you find a link that's really valuable, like you'll find some blog and you're like, wow, this is really good. Like the person who wrote this spoke clearly and explained the topic well, check the rest of their content, go to their personal web page, look for the stuff, find the blog and write it down. So in, in truth, I, I do have loads of books and I could point you out all the classics. But honestly, if you just Googled must read books programming, I guarantee the first 10 of those will be on my shelf. I'll probably just be regurgitating what everyone else will tell you. What's much more valuable is instead just learning how to find this stuff. And in my case, videos, I consume a lot of video content because you get a lot of people who will condense other people's work. And I watch stuff at 3x speed. So my, my short answer is I will go find people like Sebastian Lag, who does some really interesting and amazing video. I will watch his video like at two or three X speed, enjoy what he's done, read his resources list at the bottom, Go find the topics of the links of the papers he read, read through them, add them to my knowledge base, and then grow it from there. So you can kind of get your, your skimmed topics by finding interesting YouTubers that do stuff you like and then effectively steal their resources. And that's how you can kind of build up a knowledge base. So my recommended reading resource list is the internet and you start with Google. There you go. It's best I can, best advice I can give. Start with and... Google, not Jeeves. Yahoo. I do want to share on two more useful resources that is something for leisure. Um, so we didn't touch about how to actually find reading resources for practical code. And while Google Foo will uh, get you the general answers of how to do things right if you uh, use your Google Foo well, another good resource is obviously GitHub and solutions for the problems that you're, uh, you've been trying to solve, seeing how they approached the questions you're probably asking or just things that you're taking interest in. For example, I uh, have a fascination with cloth physics, we'll call it that. And I read a lot of useless verlet simulations and whatever else. And um, there are a million ways to implement it, but it's a really good resource to see how others 
took that approach and how they're faking whatever they're faking if they need to. And the other practical thing I wanted to mention is, while it's not the cleanest uh, reading material, the compiled code is amazing to understand how things work when you don't know when you're over your head about how to make a system that you know that exists in a million other places. Just get anything like uh, DNSpy, ILSpy, open any piece of content that you like and see how it ticks. One of the most fun things ever is to just open something up, see, oh, that's how it works, and maybe try and even tinker with it if you like. Modding is great. Uh, <laughs> and lastly, for leisure, um, David mentioned uh, Player One and reading fantasy novels. I actually read a lot of fantasy and uh, other world novels, and uh, I use Bookwalker on my phone. And then in 2021, I've read more than 100 books. So <laughs> oh, wow. not exactly a light reader. Um, it's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. And it, was, it is very inspiring. Said? Bookwalker. What do you use? Bookwalker? Yeah. Never heard of that. Not sponsored, but I mean, just... <laughs> it's an application Ooh, on the phone. You can buy books and you can read them and high quality and all that. And I just buy a bunch of them. Whenever there are discounts, there are plenty. And I read through a lot. Also, uh, on that note, one book I recently read had a meme that was originated from Terraria, which made me laugh because I'm finally <laughs> reading <laughs> or inspired. <laughs> yeah. So. Awesome. Uh, oh, another app like that I recommend too is one called Readwise. Readwise is great. Um, effectively, what it does is it lets you put in all the books you're reading and you can mark and highlight sections that are valuable to you. Um, and you'll get emails full of the most highlighted things, either from you or from other people. So it's effectively like um, sort of, uh, I forgot the name of it, where you're re repetition learning. It's like repetition learning for quotes and things that are from your books. So it's a really interesting way to get like reminders from topics of things that interest you. So yeah, Readwise is another one. I, uh, Readwise. Readwise. Yeah, so I use that one quite a bit too. Uh, I also Audible. I listen to a lot of audiobooks there. Mm. Um, everywhere. Like, again, just get get a Skillshare, get a Plural site, get a go through YouTube, just GDC you know, Vault. Uh, yeah, consume all of the things. Like, I, it, all, like the it, thing it's that all helps useful. me a lot is um, watching other people just talk about code too, like listening to podcasts, watching things like this, and even just talking to you guys regularly. Like, I'd say I learn at least one new thing every week, which is which is really nice. Like I always, I feel like I always pick up something cool every week, and I assume everybody's learning something. Hopefully, well, maybe not all you guys, but hopefully everybody watching is learning at least something every week and, and having fun with it. And there was a question about multiplayer games that I want to dive into, but before we do, I wanted to just beg everybody to hit the thumbs up button, share the stream and subscribe if you don't mind. If you're already watching and you kind of like questions and answers and this kind of stuff, just hit the buttons. It does help and uh, it makes it so that we're more likely to do the same kind of topics. All right. Do so you guys want to jump on to this next question or was there anything else you wanted to add on to the resources? Nope. All right. So how when you design a multiplayer game, an online multiplayer game, what kinds of technical questions are important to answer in the design phase? This, this is a big one. There are probably a couple of really important technical questions and then some that vary from project to project. Yorai, you look like you got a couple ideas already in mind. I, I, I have the most important one. And I, it's not cynical and I'm not memeing, but the, the, the most important question here is why? And let me unpack that a bit. When you say you want an online multiplayer game, you obviously can't simulate the universe. You can't make anything work for everything ever. You can't say the game will work for 1,000 players concurrently and at real time, and they each support a whole, uh, simulating a whole army that com uh, they only command uh, against all the other players. Now, when you say why, it's because Online multiplayer games have so many different implementations, you need to know which one you're going to be working on. And that's really important. Is the user story, the, the, the online game that you want to make, four adventurers going to kill a dragon? Or is it four players trying to command an army that can fight in a competitive manner? 
or is it a hundred players playing hide and seek in some stupid town that has way too many props? The answer will change how your entire game, both in design and both in code, will look like. Also, card games. Card games exist. <laughs> right. Yeah. So all of these touch on different implementations of multiplayer. For example, um, a turn-based game can be done with asynchronous... Uh, is it asynchronous? I forget the name, but uh, the multiplayer where it's not actually two yeah. players connected, they just like asynchronous re- gameplay where they're taking turns, send a message, and then yeah. the other person gets their notification or message back to update the state, and then you go on to the next player's turn. That's yeah, definitely yeah. one, which totally different from some of the other options you're about to talk about, right? Yeah, and yeah, and if you have a big a thing that has way too many variables to send uh, from player to player, what you'll do is you'll want to simulate inputs, send those between the player and the other players. And that will either be through lockstep or replication. And that changes the entire model of how your code looks, depending on which one you choose. Do you want to give a scenario for that? Like what types of games uh, lockstep is most common with? Uh, Or where where uh, you need that, where you've got so many things that... That so, you're not sending over state, you're sending over inputs and things. Yeah, so the, usually you can apply this to anything, but the, the short gist is you don't want to trust the uh, player to send accurate information. So usually you'll say, well, he's sending what he's pressing, and that way I know he can't cheat because only the buttons are what he can send. He obviously can cheat what buttons he's pressing, but say it's a turn based game, there is no benefit in that. So you can send between the players um, the inputs. The other player sees, oh, the player pressed that input. I'm going to create the state of the game where he pressed these inputs on my end. And then we can see how the game rolled out. And um, that's not necessarily lockstep. Again, it can be for replication. But what going uh, in lockstep is the game can't advance until both players are in the same state. And that means in, say, um, a real-time strategy game that has a million units going around, you don't want to create some weird state where two players are commanding an army pressing a million clicks and the army starts diverging in a way that's not reconcilable so that both players can see the same thing. Lockstep exists to solve that. It says, the player pressed here wait a moment, let everything catch up so it's exactly the same state, and then I'll simulate another click that some other player made, and then we can see how things roll out. Usually that uh, lockstep is also done with some input buffering into the future. So you click, but the, the, your action is only going to be processed like one tenth of a second later. So it has, it has the tenth of a second to actually reach the other player, and that mm-hmm. can happen at the same time. So that's that's one type where you got just tons of, and it's like you got lots and lots of units. It's a really common common way to do it. A state, about, really what, compli- okay. a state that's really complicated to replicate. And what other yeah. ones? Uh, well, I guess what other kinds of technical? So you got to think about the how many people are going to be there, how many things are moving around to decide what you're going to do. If it's like I said four or hundreds or multi. What about the difference between just the number of players and units? So like. 100 separate players versus four players with 25 units each. That's something you would want to consider as well? Yeah, obviously. I mean, you know how much, how many things you're allowed to send because net costs aren't free and there's obviously lags and other things that get result that become a problem because you're sending too many things and Mm -hmm. too many big things. So the bigger your game, the more consideration you have to give both to the design so that players will send less data. Um, if gameplay means, for example, do you need to tell everyone where uh, each player, where all the hundred uh, other players are? Or can you actually call out uh, what synchronizations you can give them based on an area they're in, the stupid town where they actually can see half of each other because there's big buildings in the middle? Um, it, it it gets complicated, but yeah. those are very important decisions because they can drive your design. You can say, well, I am going to make a 100-player game, but we don't have the skill set or the manpower to make 
a whole town that supports hiding messages, yada, yada, yada. Can we just make it a bit uh, simpler so that I can do this and that to solve problems that we know we'll have? Uh, one other thing people, I think, often forget about is outside of the networking part and outside of the, d- having so many players on, like just having a bunch of people in a game sometimes will cause other problems, like visual rendering problems, right? It, you got to think about like if I've got a game that allows 16 people in the game or maybe 100 players or maybe it's a, like a thousand player game, what happens and how do I deal with scenarios where too many players are going there to render? Do we have a plan for that? Um, is that something we're supporting? You got to think about all of these things, not just the the bandwidth and the networking part. Right? There's there's a lot to it when you get a bunch of players in interacting with different things. You got to have enough stuff for them to interact with and and all that as well. Um, yeah, the, the the classic horror story of um, the this, uh, the division where in order to start your mission you have to talk to one NPC and everyone has to line up like a train behind them because you have to have one character that everyone in the entire game has to interact with. So yeah, there's design considerations on top of the networking ones too. Yeah, well, Andrew's got to head out in just a second, so I wanted to um, make him big and give him a chance to say goodbye to everybody in that nice Unity hoodie. Yeah, very nice. Although I accidentally washed it in wa- warm water, so now the zipper goes down to the side, and it's a little too small, and so it's going to be retired shortly. I know. It's a shame. Um, but yes, goodbye, everybody. I, I want to say for the multiplayer one, Jason, you brought up an interesting point that I was going to talk about, like player interaction, especially if you've got all these different players what what, do you, what happens if two two or three all attack you know one player at the same time and their damages all bubble up into you know it, it it's an interesting thing um these considerations of in my head having never designed any of these uh and played only very few uh you know the player interaction seems like a huge hurdle of how you manage that and make it feel right um I don't know how to solve it, but it just seems like a huge challenge. Uh, for it's anyone. certainly something they should ask, though, and think about like how they're going to solve yes. those. Like not just the design part, but the technical parts that are going to come with those design fixes for those those problems. Yeah. So I'm going to go. See yeah. you all. Have a good all one. Right. Good to see you, Andrew. See you next week. Everybody, go check out Infinity PVR, and I got a bunch of his assets linked down below. Nice. All right. So you guys have any more on this or do you um, want to jump over to the next th- th- There's one more on this because I think it's often misunderstood and it drives me kind of slightly insane. Um, yes, we, we can go down the, the, the technical questions and like if you make your systems more deterministic, it's easier for you to run more of the simulation locally and all these kinds of stuff. But that's there are resources for that. Something that I don't think is talked about enough is very subtle, but it's if you make your game multiplayer, it has design implications. And a lot of people, and I'm not talking about balance, I'm not talking about numerically making it make sense. I mean, fundamentally, if your game's multiplayer, it'll play differently. And a good example of this is, uh, for me at least, Borderlands 3. I like Borderlands. Borderlands is a fun series, but the game is very dialogue heavy. It's about characters giving you funny quips and dialogue to send you on missions. And if you play that game multiplayer, like I did with a group of friends, where you're you're on Skype or Discord and you're talking among yourselves and having fun and completely ignoring the quippy dialogue and the ongoing plot, you lose where you are. It's not the same game. As a game designer, the experience you are designing is presumptively people who are heavily engaged in the content you're producing. If you create a multiplayer experience, you are risking or at least changing the, the dynamic such that players are going to engage with your content differently. And you need to take that into account. You need to know that they'll be talking among themselves. They'll be less attentive. They'll be more engaged in memeing and messing with each other. Uh, Does your gameplay incentivize team damage? If it does, is that a, a place for design where you have things like fun interactions where you can stun or interact with your friends? Is that going to change balance or break things? Like, in general, just keep in mind that you can't just take a two to it, 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 you know, it's a normal game and just say, and I'll make it multiplayer, it'll be fine. You have to recontextualize it in the context of being multiplayer to see how the game holds up. Because you might find it was fun without multiplayer, but it wasn't when it has it, or the other way around. It might have not been fun until you added more players. These kinds of things also need consideration. 
I think that's all good advice. Anybody got anything else on this or? And I only answered the first question I've uh, asked back, but <laughs> there, it, it's a rabbit hole, but technical questions are a dime a dozen for an online multiplayer game. Um, like Jason mentioned, does your game serve the purposes? Um, does the multiplayer serve the purposes of what the game you're trying to make is? It's, it's a good question. I will say that if we are assuming it's going to be multiplayer no matter what, then make sure that players always have something that they can do so that they don't get locked out of playing, which is a big problem that actually I found um, in Saints Row 4, which completely ruined the fun. Because every time a player pauses, the game can continue for the other player. You are stuck. You're waiting in a, a screen just waiting until the other player unpauses. And that happens to either player, and it also happens whenever they open some weird menus to just level up and stuff. The worst. <laughs> Make sure that the experience is good if you are uh, making an all-multiplayer game. Obviously, you can tackle this during the implementation phase, but try to predict it in the design phase. Try to, in your mind's eye, as we've talked about with VR, share an experience that you can imagine together and see how that rolls out. All right, I want to hit this question that I know um, a couple people had answers for. So it was about joining a new team. What is your advice to those joining new teams on how to quickly learn a code base and how to assess w w what to work with there and then become a technical team lead or become a lead of the team. So this is from somebody who's coming in as a senior developer and would like to be effective in kind of leading some change or helping kind of grow this project or, or fix the problems that it's having. And they're looking for just general advice. Like you come on to a new game or an existing game that's a, or a project, whatever it is, and you want to join up, what's the first thing that you guys like to do to um, figure out what's going on there, what you should be doing, and how you can contribute best to the team? You guys got uh, some thoughts? Yeah, I have some thoughts, but I first want to correct that the original message uh, actually had four separate questions in it. And they were how to join new teams, how to quickly learn the code base, how to assess what is working within that code base, and how to effectively lead the team in a time of change, which is something particular. Uh, not all teams will go through. Um, do we want to answer each one of these separately? Sure. Yeah. The, yeah. Hit all of them. So yeah, when you so, when you join, what do you guys like to do first to just learn the code base? Like, is it do you have a process? Is there something that you like to do? Do you just, dive right in and read all the code? Do you run the code? Do you just start breaking things, writing unit tests? What do you do? No, nobody else. Okay. Oh, oh uh, Dave's yeah, silent. Too. Dave just mutes himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look at this bear. Apparently quiet. Dave's answer is start miming, I think is the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for me, I'll, I'll just really quickly explain what I like to do. Personally, I like to really dive into the actual product first like figure out what it does like what if it's a, a game then play through the game make sure that i kind of understand a lot of the intricacies i won't play through the whole thing but try to get a good idea of how all of the systems work and what the things mean because the second i'm looking at code and i'm looking at some like domain specific thing something that's specific to the game or the application i'm going to have no idea what that means unless i've actually played through it or seen the application in in work so I, I like to get it up there get it running see what it is and then look usually what i'll do is look at bugs so i'll look at a couple like just low hanging fruit bugs first see what's what's been hanging around what what the big ones are that are kind of hanging on that people aren't fixing or what people are working on now and then what a couple really easy ones are and i like to just jump in and um knock out a couple bugs on my own side to make sure that i'm not breaking things so i'll go through fix a couple things, um, show it to people, make sure that these fixes are right and that I'm not missing some big giant thing. Because there have been cases where I thought, you know, a small fix would fix something, but you find out there's this whole other system or a whole other application using this code that I didn't know about that this is going to break. So I like to do a little bit of fixing, show it to people, and then um, go from the After that, I start to 
dive into actually looking at what the code's doing. Sometimes I'll put in breakpoints if I'm not sure and just step through code on a process. If I'm like, you know, how does this thing deal with damage or how does this process connect to these servers? I'll just put it in a breakpoint there, do it, step through, and just kind of get an idea of what the state of the application is. I'll look at the local data, add some watches, and see what's happening as the process is going so I can get a, a good idea of what it's doing beyond just what I think it's doing when I read it. Because a lot of time I'll read it, think it's doing something, miss one little line or one little condition and not realize it's doing something totally different. So that's kind of like what I like to do on the first you know, couple days, like first week or so, just go through looking at stuff like that and fixing as many little things as possible without having a big impact while I kind of get familiar with the code, the lingo, and see how things are, are tied together. Um, yeah, I'm back. Am I hey, right? Dave. Hey, it's back. There we go. Um, <laughs> I read the design docs. First thing I do, I sit down. I read the There's design the docs. Touch the code. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I've tried that a, once, and it didn't. It didn't work I'm out well. The first time I tried reading a design doc, it was 160 pages, and 152 of them were lore. <laughs> <laughs> and three years old, and written by someone who no longer works yeah. at the company. None of, almost none of it applied to the game, and neither did the other eight pages. That listed Maybe you even replaced things them. that weren't in the game. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I basically, I want to get a feel for, I mean, I should know the thing before I go in there, but I want to get a feel for what they wanted to do in the first place um, before I dive into the code and start looking at it. I mean, if you're going to be a senior coder and you're going to be managing these people, you might be doing more of a management role than you are actually doing a coding role in a lot of senses and stuff. And then it's all about how you talk to the team and stuff, but we're going through learning the code base. Uh, yeah, play it, get it going, uh, run it, breakpoint it. Yeah. I'm going to approach this. I, I, I kind of want to approach this from the way the person asked the questions because it actually laid it out very uh, neatly. And how to join a new team is a very good question because when you join a project, you have to understand what the project tries to deliver first. And you, like David said, you should know to a degree what it is, but you can dive deeper into it, understand exactly what they're trying to deliver and then how they're delivering it. And then you ask every person in the team how they're delivering, what they're delivering and what they are, are they trying to deliver right now? So you know the current project state from every person's perspective so you can tr start addressing things. Then you can start quickly learning the code base by saying, okay, so it's supposed to do that. It's doing it this way, this kind of implementation. And I, I'm seeing how it all works in whatever UI. It's not necessarily a game. And then I can start breakpointing and see, okay, so it, they use this system to provide me this result, which is the experience that they want to deliver. They are doing it by yada, yada, yada. And then with that, I can start seeing, um, I, I can, you can, when you're with a team, try to use the team to your advantage if you're to get up to pace quickly. So if you're trying to assess what is working with them, um, ask what kind of uh, parts of this project are the best parts. Because to each employee, the answer might be different. And you need to know what you shouldn't mess with, necessarily. Hmm. So... And, and they might even give you tips on what they do want changes for which is what is working, what is not working. Usually what's not working will be things they want changed or removed or adjusted, whatever have you improved upon. And um, I, I just want to touch on the last one, how to effectively lead the team in a time of change. Let them help you. Um, team effort is you joining them, leading by example. And to lead by example, you need to know how they do things and correct, not do entirely different. Um, necessarily, but asking them the questions will give you information so you can deliver value to them more quickly. Sorry if I'm making a bit abstract, it's just no, no, I think that's good mm -hmm. advice. And I kind of glossed over the whole joining a team part and just wanted to mention that I think it's really important that when you join it, you know, join it with some humility and don't go in there trying to you know, smack yeah. everybody around and change things. Don't go in there telling everybody that the code sucks because if the code sucks, they probably already right. know and they're going to tell you next week if you just relax and 
you start arguing with him, you're just going to set up a combative environment from the start and and make it all negative. Start positive, you know, you're there to help and make things better, not to criticize and t- tear the place and, down from the start. And there's something really important here. And the code is just a means to an end. You don't care about what the code is in the end of the day. People are trying to deliver some value via either spreadsheets or a game or a fun feeling uh, or some research material. The code is only the means to make that happen. So you need to know what they're trying to deliver. The code is just there for you to change or make it work. So, um, oh, go on, you go on, Jason. I've been... I know I'm I'm gonna go on like an hour long essay. So you're gonna say delete all the code and start the project over the day you get in there. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Fire them all, hire a new team. This is all trash. We're starting from scratch. So I've I've taken over a fair number of um, technical teams through the years, but the one thing I like to do is when I first step in, I like to interview everybody and not interview them to keep their job or anything like that. Interview them to find out what they did. Uh, So go in there and say, "Hi, I'm David." just join the team I'm, I'm really interested in what you've what you've done and then find out what they've done on the project because as you says they'll start coming out with saying what they're really impressed about and what they're really happy they did and all the rest of it and also that will highlight areas of the code that you know to go and speak to that person if there's a problem in that area or if like you know what everybody does on the team you know their extents as well you know what they might like to improve if you're a technical lead turn around to people and say look what would you like to improve on how how do you find best to improve on your skills and all the rest? And then help them with that, you know, send them to resources, get resources brought over for them to be able to do that. Um, it's always a good idea to know your team in and out before you start jumping in. Um, so interview them. There's no harm in it, you know, and make sure they know you're not interviewing them to keep their job because I've had that before. Uh, where people come in and they're shaking because they're the new team, the new managers turned up or I'm a new CTO at a company for a bit. And they're like, oh, God, this guy's going to come in and fire us all. It's not the case. You you, you need to put them at ease. And the way to put them at ease is to turn around and go, oh, tell me what you've done. This is an exciting project. You know, tell me what you've been working on, what you've built. And then start digging into it and ask them questions about, oh, why did you do it that way? That sounds awesome. And then just be a nice person, not a complete dick. Um Make sure they you, know that you're. Uh, I I just want to say, make sure they know you're with them, not against them. Yeah, That's exactly. The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Put them in their comfort zone, and also if you talk to them about the stuff they've been working on, it will immediately open them up to be able to talk to you further about when you put new tasks in front of them, etc. You know, you put, I know you've been working on this. How about this task? How about this task? Because you know what their specialties are. So be personable and then, yeah, go and interview the entire team and interview them on their own, interview them in groups afterwards, stand in in all the sprints. You might, if you're, so sometimes when you're CTO, you have managers underneath you and then they have people underneath them and they have people underneath them. It's a good idea to go and stand in all those sprints and also cross discipline sprints. If you're a technical lead, Ask to go and sit in on the sprints for the design team, the art team. There are other groups on the thing, just so you've got a handle on where the game is as a whole. And don't just take the lead producer's word on it. Go and sit in with those other teams because it's it's invaluable information. I, I'm so glad you mentioned the interview one because that was like that was going to be my. Nobody's mentioned this yet. That to me is the most important part. Um, so this is for, I love this topic because. This is literally what I do. This is more than anything, my job. Uh, and I wasn't good at it. I was a programmer and I wasn't very good with people and I hated people. and I didn't like dealing with them. And so I had to learn this very, very hard. And I now have it down to a fine art. And I'm quite proud of my ability to deal with this particular problem, which is the people problem. Um, and so I, I have very specific stuff I do. And the first thing is, as as Jason said, uh, you... You try it. Whatever the project is, you you use the product um, for two reasons. One, so you know what the hell you're talking about. Um, and two, because you're a programmer, you're, you're going to be looking through the code with an eye for how you would design it, which is like earmarks for, I would do this. So a decent team would probably do the same. That's where I'll look to find that thing. So that's just one. You, you always do that. The next one is what I think is probably more interesting and has more benefits than people realize is I will ask for a tour from multiple people. If you take the lead programmer and say, 
can you walk me through the code base? Just show it to me. This serves multiple purposes. The first one is you're subordinating yourself to them, which looks great to start a team. You're sitting by their side and say, I'm just going to watch what you're doing. Two, it lets them walk through it and both gush about the parts they're proud of and also give you the apology they're going to give you for the bits that they know you would be like, okay, it, it's a bit like this, but we actually planned this and whatever this. But what this is really doing is it's telling you the points of interest because they're pointing out the parts they're currently working on, the parts that they think are the best made, and the parts they think are the worst made. All of this is just passively going by, and it lets you make mental notes of that might need a refactor, that's what they're currently thinking about, that's where their priorities are, and that's the bit they quite like. So all the while, they're going through this, and they're kind of showing you the code. If you can get that recorded as well, even better, you can go back through it later. So I will specifically get a tour. And it also, as per your point, I will get a tour from multiple people. I'll get a tour from the programmers to see how they think about the project via code. I'll get the same thing from the art department because they will then show me, here's the bits I quite like or the UX or the UI. And it helps that I have a background in some of these topics that when someone brings up a UI, I can praise parts I see and go, oh, that's a good idea. You changed that color for that for this reason. They're like, yeah, I did. Glad someone noticed. And it also means that I can prove when sitting with them that I know what their job is, I know that there's decisions being made, I can point out ones that are well done, and I can slowly assert my position by saying, that's good, but you know what, I've read that if you do this, this is good, and they'll be like, oh, okay, I can send you on some resources, and I can send them a link. So now you're assigning the fact that you understand their job, and you're providing valuable resources for them to get better, which serves another purpose, which is if you can assign some level of homework to each person on the team as you meet them, uh, you don't have to tell them to do it. You just say, oh, you might like this article. It can give you a good insight into whether that person is a self-starter or not. Because if you give each person homework, some people will love that. Like me, if someone gave me stuff to read, I'll have read it by the next time I talk to them. Other people, that's not how they work. This isn't a judgment on character, but it lets you know the kinds of people that you can give homework to and the kinds of people you have to watch a bit because they will be focused on their own things. So this gives you a lot of information very, very quickly. Who's your team? Who can you manage? Who needs more hands-on? Where the project is going? What parts are there? And so on. Um, as for the documentation, I will take the, the, the stance that personally, I will ask for every single piece of documentation I get my hands on but 99.9% .9 of the time it's fucking useless because if it's not dated, what's even worse is it's it's got its own domain language. You will find a team that's longer than a year old will start writing documentation using all the glossary terms without defining them. And they'll be talking about the topic back and forth. They'll be using archaic connected stuff through multiple systems with the presumption that everybody knows where the right pages and links and emails are. And it's mostly gibberish, even with the best of intentions. And also, people who haven't done this before have not learned how to speak cross-discipline. So programmers will speak programmerese, and the business side will speak business ease, and none of the documents make sense. And they might be referring to the same topics, but they won't realize it. So a big part of my job when I come in will be to go to the business and say, sell me the dream. What is the vision for the product? Go to the programmers and say, what are they asking you to make? And if I see a disconnect there, my job is to start that conversation and say, oh, you're building this system, well, would this do? And they're like, I don't know, I was told to make this. I'm like, well, let me just check with them. Would you be okay with this? Okay, cool. They actually want this, so we don't need to do that. And because I'm a programmer, I know where the time would be. I know what will be shortcuts, and I know what will be long-term. So I can ease the situation by coming up with, like, I'll go to a programmer and say, we can do A, B, or C. You'll get your time estimates from your sprints or whatever. You can go back to the business and say, look, you want this, you can have A, B, or C, talk it out with them, and then go back to the programmer, and then you start to build that relationship where you're on the programmer's side because you're helping kind of fill that gap by basically picking easier tasks by working with the, the project in a way. Um, it, like, yeah, it, this, is, I love, this is such a fascinating time. There's so much to do with this, but it, it basically boils down to psychological safety and people feeling like they own things. One of the biggest mistakes project managers do is they try to own a project and delegate work in a way which makes it feel like people are basically autonomous drones. And what you get if you do that is a whole load of people who will work to rule. They'll do exactly what you say and almost smugly ignore the intent. Even if you explain what you're trying to do, people will just do exactly what you said, not what you actually want done. But if you bring everyone in as a conversation and talk about, make sure everyone's sold on the same vision of the project. They all want the same thing. And then once that's true, 
you give people a slice of the pie. You say this is yours so you can take pride in it. And that way, if they think it's theirs and you give them tasks to do, you don't tell them how to do it. You might say, we need this. This is how I would approach it. What do you think? Because if they do it, they can come back to you, own it, and everybody will work better on a project they feel like they own. So in short, managing a team is a very big, complicated thing. Or, and it's not even management. If you're coming in as a new person on a team, a lot of the same rules apply. You have to know what everyone's doing. You have to know where you can add value. You have to know what the goals of the project are versus what you can apply to it and then slowly build it out. So it's there's a lot of work in it, but the, the general goal is to just, yeah, the, the, the short answer is to be nice and effectively get to know people. Obviously, I'm a bit more clinical at my approach to how I do that, but it's the, the rules are the same. You just have to find people where they're at effectively, you know? Agreed. All right, so we've got a couple more questions, and we've got a giveaway. We'll probably kick off in the next 10 minutes or so. So everybody who wants to enter that and win a copy of Rider, just hang on another 10 minutes. So start it up and then let everybody enter and uh, battle out for the last for the next copy while we answer a couple more questions. Um, there was a question here about level design, and I wanted to see if any of you guys had any quick suggestions here. So the, the person mentioned that their trees look not great. And they're wondering if you can suggest a technical approach for level design, like putting down trees, foliage, buildings, to get a good environment for somebody who's not really into art and wants to focus on the coding gameplay. But they want a nice looking environment without being an artist. Do you guys have some good recommendations for that? I'm sure Andrew would have three dozen asset store recommendations if you were still here. But outside of using something like Gaia or one of the dungeon generators, I don't have any great suggestions. Do you guys have anything? Watch somebody who's really good at doing it on YouTube. Does that work for you? Are you able to watch somebody and recreate? I can't do it. I try to Uh, watch and recreate it, and I end up Uh, with like a worse version of that and inability to customize it and make it my own very well. Yeah, so I'm... No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that if you're just looking to just play and have some go play, go buy an asset and just play with it and uh, have, a, have a look at what they did with it. Um, the problem, the, when you look at terrain and foliage and all the rest of it, make sure it fits. Like, go outside, look at a picture. The amount of times you see a tree that's just sitting, clipped into the terrain, and there's just a tree just sitting on it. It drives me nuts. I, I can't stand that. I want to see some little foliage around it. Look at how the world looks. Uh, obviously, you can't go really deep unless you want to go photogrammetry and all the rest. But, um, yeah, if you're going to sculpt terrain and do trees and all the rest of it, go and have a look at the world. Uh, and actually, uh, to, to kind of piggyback on that, the best bit of advice I ever heard on this came from Peter Fields, who was one of the, the level designers on The Last of Us. Um, he said that when you try to design levels or, or whatever else, people like patterns and you're going to fall into the bad habit of nicely, neatly lining up your trees because that's what you want. You want a nice, neat structure. And that's not how nature works, right? Things grow in chaos and things will build up randomly so the best thing you can do for your level design is give yourself constraints so start by sculpting some rubbish terrain just place a nice big clump of crap and have different heights and stuff then start the problem because now you have to actually design around a problem there is now stuff in the way of where you wanted to put that building and fight the urge to just clean the terrain instead pretend this is how the world works and start to put things in and build it up in a way that starts to feel organic. And you'll find yourself solving problems, both naturally by, I can't put stuff there, so I might put a waterfall here to make that make sense. Otherwise, that bit doesn't make sense. And you'll find the design you come up with is a lot more interesting than it would have been otherwise. So one, start with mess. That's just a great way to do it. Um, And then two, for level design stuff, it's a lot more about narrative and intent. Um, Place something down that represents the player, and at the very start of whatever you're doing for your level design, pick an objective. And the the again, the classic example for something like that is the is the Bioshock style build a lighthouse. So that could just be as simple as put down your crappy terrain, put a capsule somewhere on that terrain, put a giant cylinder, pretend it's a lighthouse or something. You now have with nothing else, a unique environment, an obs an, an objective 
obstacles, and a player. Suddenly, level design becomes a lot easier because now it's a case of how do I design the route from here to here? It's not arbitrarily putting trees down. You've already got an environment, a goal, a player. So start with chaos, work up from there. Yeah, so I, I want to say you covered everything I wanted to bring up um, and more. But if we are looking at it um, in another way, a person who just wants to focus on coding gameplay should not be concerned about uh, level design. And if we're talking technical approach, make the things that you want. And if you find a real need to have a level, find where the feature you want to add, the, the, the gameplay, would be looking its best and then make a scene for that. Specifically, just that. Find any reference that says, when I am striking the final boss and it has to look epic, what are epic scenes for killing a final boss? Find any reference you want. Try to imitate it. It's, it's way easier than it sounds. I, I, well, I, I'm really not seeing that concern of but a person who wants to focus on coding gameplay deciding to that they have to design a level now. I, I would usually do it in a flat box. <laughs> They probably just want it to look pretty. I would go with the, mm. the asset store stuff yeah. generally myself. Stuff. <laughs> well, in my case, I just love the concept. Like, I'm, I'm not naturally a level designer, but once I started looking at it, I realized it's a fascinating field because there's things that people don't think about. Um, like, for example, somewhere on Twitter, I forgot who did it. I have it in my notes log somewhere. So let me find it before I, rather than just talking about it arbitrarily. Uh, here we go. And this is why you have a knowledge base, so I can instantly link the things I'm about to talk about. Uh, How here, many little buttons did you click to even get that? <laughs> before, um, yeah. So this is a fantastic series of uh, images on Twitter, which highlights the point I'm, I'm going to make here. This is like a lot of detail about the complexity of which stairs to choose in your level design, because what you don't think about with stairs is stairs have stairs say something. Stairs tell you about the architecture of the space you're in. And I won't repeat everything that's there. You can read it for yourself. But just think, for everything like this for stairs, I could show you the same thing, but for windows and for doors and for hallways and for practical lights and for posters and for... Level design has a whole lot of interesting information in that they... Our architecture is an emotional experiential thing. Like, it's not arbitrary. Certain shapes, cert like, there's a reason why places where you want people to be calm, like creches, and, you know, anywhere where people like hospitals, tend to have rounded corners. Rounded corners are softer and more relaxed. There's a reason why places that are filled with awe and drama or, or whatever are tall, because tall has that sort of reaching to the god sky mentality, and also it causes the shadows to be vast and interesting. There's a reason why things that are meant to isolate you from the world, like prisons and anything that's meant to be office blocks and things, in general, while they may show you them in, in uh, big spaces, they tend to go downwards. They tend to have this sort of darkness, so the light is kind of from strip windows. and things. Basically, architecture is one part of this. All, all I'm saying is that just do your homework. Like there's a load of, each of these things has interesting topics to learn about it. And if you want level design, just realize that an environment tells a story. Like when you walk into a church, you feel a certain way, it implies a certain thing and your body language will change because of the space you're in. If you walk into a small village, your mentality will change because you'll have a different expectation of what's there. You don't have to get all of these things right, but you do have to be aware that you're not just arbitrarily placing trees down. You're, you are serving a purpose, which is telling a story. And so that's why I say start with the objective. Start with, I am here, I need to get here. If you know what the player needs to do, you now need to know how you want them to feel. You now need to know what architectural pieces to pick to solve that problem. Do you want a stream? What does a stream say? Do you want a giant castle? What does a giant castle say? And so for someone like me, who has no natural artistic talent, I need to work by rules. I need structures that tell me I want the player to feel this way here. How do I do that? Here's my playbook. Here's the right kinds of stairs. Here's the right kinds of doors and the right kinds of windows. So I would say just, again, do your homework. 
Yeah, there was, uh, talking about that, there was a really interesting video, and I'm not going to remember, I won't be able to find the link to it, but it was talking about placing smaller items next to bigger items for bigger perspective to make people feel things when they enter rooms and stuff like that. Learning those principles, uh, like the stairs stuff, just makes your games much more epic, much better, uh, better feeling. Um, and go in the world and have a look. So you're saying it should look like the real world, huh? It would actually like open the window and look outside? Yeah, Crazy. sometimes people have to go out and, and look. If you're going to do foliage and stuff like that, go for a walk in a park. Not a park, sorry, not a park, a natural park. Oh. <laughs> so it's all flat grass and there's a little bit of an area around a tree with some dirt, Go right? for a hike, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a dog, a dog oh. beside it. Uh, so yeah, we've opened up the giveaway real quick, just to cut in. If you want to enter to win a free copy of Rider, it's a one-year license. Just um, say any of the words on the screen, like DPS, Mage, or Tank, to pick your class and pick your race if you want to be a knight, a werewolf, or a rat, or whatever the little tiny text is there. Let you pick it, or just copy somebody else, and you can pick. Um, we did nerf the tanks a tiny bit last time, so they lost a bit of health because... I think they were like six out of the top eight finalists. So they got a small nerf. We'll see if it's enough to knock them out of the the only contenders or like completely knocks them down. But we'll kick this thing off um, maybe in like 10 minutes. We'll give everybody a few minutes to join. we got like 100, almost 200 people here and only 30 people have entered right now. So if you want to win Ryder, which is my favorite code editor and probably everybody here's favorite code editor, took me a long time to get into and start with. Um, just enter, and whoever is last one in here, it's almost completely random, except for the classes are slightly imbalanced, and we don't know where they are exactly. So other than that, though, it's just random. You'll be battling, and then the last one remaining will get the license, and we just do one a week. Um, so come back for next week if you don't win this time. All right, so you guys want to take more questions, or is there any more you wanted to add on to that last one? I, I yeah, just want to add a passing thought that gave me an existential crisis that I think I might suck at level design because Terra is entirely procedurally generated and I don't have to place anything myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's procedural, then you don't have to worry about it, right? Then you don't have to design levels. There's, it makes I mean, it so I, much easier. It's, it's, a, it's a way harder design because you have to design the rules and then you have to pray that they land in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I, I totally agree. I don't know how many times I've talked to people who had the idea that procedurally generating levels or having AI generate levels was going to make it easier and save time. Like, yeah, we're going to save time by having AI make our levels or something. Never once works. It's always the exact opposite. You get a worse version that takes a lot longer unless you spend a ridiculous amount of energy on it. To make sure it looks just right all the time, no matter what. But at one time, you're just going to have a desert with a single patch of grass, and it's going to have a giant tree that looks entirely <laughs> happy in its place. <laughs> also, it's in space for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> So do you guys, were there other questions on the list that you want to jump into? There's so many of them there that I, I kind of lost track of which one to pull up next. And I didn't want to just go in order. They're starting to get duplicated. Is there something in here that you really want to get um, into? Or well, well, to continue the level design bit, there was one question about transitioning between levels. Um, this can be taken a lot of ways. One could be, how do you build a level system which might be a question of do you use additive scenes or do you have game objects turn on and off I, i'm not going to answer that one because the answer is just pick a thing that works there's a lot of options out there a lot of systems i'd rather talk about the other side of it which is uh from a gameplay slash level design perspective how do you transition from areas and what's interesting is there are patterns for this so the 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 name for this is called the one-way valve, and it basically means a place in your level which lets the player go one way but can't traverse back. The, the classic example is in games like Tomb Raider or, um, you know, any, any of those, Uncharted, those kind of things, where your character will jump down a high ledge and they can't return back up. And so you can design your areas such that your player will land in a new area and it's non-traversal back and it doesn't feel like it's it's blocking. So 
sometimes you'll have those areas on purpose where you'll allow a piece to load, like a big door or something, and the player drops down, and they don't feel like the other areas disappear, they just feel like it's become unaccessible. Then, from a level design perspective there, there's some things to keep in mind. So here's something you might not notice unless you're really paying attention to level design. What a lot of games will do is they will start you in a location in an in a elevated position. And so you'll look down at a surrounding area. Breath of the Wild, you start in a hilltop, you look down. I, I guess you can pick a million other games and almost all of them will start you at the top because that in purpose lets you survey the land. It also lets them point out points of interest. So by putting you in a point, you get what's called a first read, which gives you the what does it look like the moment you see it? What does my instinct tell me? Where is the game telling me to go? And so certain things will point out, big things, small things, whatever else. And there'll be something that you want as a game designer for the player to go to. And so the, the, the part from Zelda I really love is people remember the bit where Link runs up and there's a dramatic look out on the horizon and the music plays. What they don't remember is you still can't control Link until the camera does that first. Before it lets go, it turns the camera from the big open landscape and points directly at the fucking <laughs> temple of time. It points you at exactly where it wants you to go first, then you get control back. You don't have to go there, but it's made sure that you know there's a big thing with a giant temple right in front of you, straight line path, that's where I want you to go. And whether you realize it or not, most people will run down there. And if you if that wasn't enough, the path to it has things like a tree with a bright red apple on it and various things that will lead your eye along that path. So from a level design perspective, you start off with introduce a new area, put them on a high ground, let them survey the land, have points of interest, guard them to a point of interest, direct them in that direction. And if you want them to not go back, have a one-way valve, which either drops them down some vent or sewer or climb up something and the ladder breaks or a cliff breaks behind you or something breaks, something that blocks the path behind you. Then have them traverse a space. And if you want a little extra bit of level design, have something like a doorway that's locked. And then later on, traverse back and have that door openable that returns them to the old area. Because that now gives you this feeling of unlocking and connecting areas in space. So, so yeah. I, I just want to point out, with Link at the uh, Temple of Time, if you go to the uh, left, you immediately die because there's a cliff. So uh, that also helps directing players to where you want them that to go. Help, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, cliffs cliffs are fun. Uh, they do also, serve the purpose, um, the uh, one-way valve. There's also another name for it. It's a point of no return, and points of no return are really common in most adventure games. But they're also included mm -hmm. in um, Metroidvanias, for example. Um, specifically, the latest one, Metroid Red, was chock full of points of no return because they wanted to make sure that you always know where to go, which is a problem because players tended to get lost in the original Metroid games. Then they tried to add objectives, but player found that too intrusive. So now what they're doing is they're locking you out of the places you're not supposed to go right now so that they make sure you find whatever you need to find. And um, yeah, it's a good design tool. Just make sure that the player doesn't feel too closed off out of it because while it may yeah. look natural in the game context, the player might still go, wait, oh, wait, I wanted to go uh, get that one thing, and now they suddenly can't. That might be a ruiner for uh, comfort. Yeah, be careful. Um, and part, part of this, too, is design language. You want to make it very visually clear when something is or isn't available. One of the most frustrating things is games where, like, you see this all the time with beginner games on Itch, where you have a corridor with a whole load of doors, and they're all locked except for one and there's nothing telling you the difference between them. And so as a game design feature, you're going to have to walk through and check every door. But because people are repeatable and for the most part follow the same rules, it's not going to be the first one. It's not going to be the last one, which leaves only the middle ones. It's most likely going to be feeling like a progression thing. So it's probably going to be further in the direction outwards rather than close. So law of averages, if I give you a corridor of five doors, it'll be the fourth one in usually on the left. So even without playing it, you can usually tell exactly what door a novice game designer will put the key because their their mindset is going to be very simply around progression without really thinking through the design of the space. So a lot of this stuff you want to avoid, and the way you avoid that is you need visual signifiers. So there's signifiers you can do to indicate that a space is not part of the story or not traversable. 
The biggest one of these you're really familiar with without realizing it is metal bars. Anytime a door has metal bars on it, you know that's not part of the standard path. It is a blocked door. Now, there's differences between locks and whatever, but usually there's either a grate or something blocking it, and that's a visual signifier that this door, unlike other doors, is not even worth trying. It's not going to be part of this process. It's part of level design. And there's a lot of these too. Same with anytime you ever see a wall with scratches on it, you know you can climb it. That is the universal signifier for this white bit of wall with some lines on it is telling you other people have climbed this ergo your character can climb this and if you want to be really hammer this home because you're afraid it's not clear you put a ledge on the top of it and the ledge is often a bright color usually a yellow sometimes a blue so learning the the design language of levels is helpful as well and that's so how do you have levels where where Switching between scenes, well, the truth is you make people just walk the right way. And the way you do that is by using the various level design rules to kind of funnel them through to the right directions. Are you guys ready to um, kick off the the giveaway competition? We've got one minute to go. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start it at 11.45 and it's 11.44. So last chance i guess if you want to win a one year copy of right or last chance this week you can come back next week and try again <laughs> but last chance this week to win a copy of rider free one year license it's like 150 dollars normally or something like that it's definitely worthwhile i still actually i don't know about you guys but i, I pay for my rider license just because i feel like i talk about it so much that i don't ever want to be biased that like i only like it because it's free like i, I pay for it because i think it's more than worth it um so yeah, definitely check it out. Use it if you don't already. Try it. And you guys ready to hit the giveaway? And did yeah. you guys all enter already? I am not entering. I'm saving it for the one day I'm going to commit a top ten anime betrayal moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I guess we can we can hit the button. I'll, I'll wait until the timer ticks over to the end of the minute. It looks like a couple people are still trickling in, and then we'll start it off, and then maybe dive into. I think we got time for maybe one more question right seems like we get about 15 minutes per question is is about the the correct rate so let's see any second now my clock's gonna tick and i'm gonna hit the button and we're gonna get a countdown oh Whoa. also with this i put in some of the optimizations that i, I wanted to talk about i didn't revert okay. them out so you might notice um the lighting is a little bit missing right now because i didn't re-enable it <laughs> and uh things might look Optimized. a little bit strange hopefully <laughs> everything looks right though i, I mean everything works yeah. okay yeah. all right let's i just it. want to say optimizing by removing features is this your p <laughs> <laughs> the game works so much better without light and models i got rid of all the character models and the lights now the lights was actually an accident it was like partially in the middle of something, turned them off and forgot to flip them back on. So, all right, the fight is beginning. And am I in round one? No, I forgot. We randomized right at the beginning, so everybody got mixed up. Yeah, ninety-one. There's somebody who is not supported in the font. What's that? Somebody is not supported in the font. Their text is circled. Yeah, the boxes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's a shame. Your atlas is too limited. You need to fix that. It's just using one of the default fonts from Text Mesh Pro, I think. Pretty sure I didn't change it. it, it we probably need to, though. Figure out what that is. Elim initiated. <laughs> we got Elim initiated. No artist available. Oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah, they did. That's awesome. We need more messages like that. <laughs> <laughs> so for everybody watching, the way this thing works is the characters just come out from each side um, and then go one-on-one -on -one and randomly fight the, each round. So you'll see that they kind of attack in line with each other right now. But each round, they decide, uh, they roll, and whoever rolls the highest number does the attack and hits the other one. And then the classes have some variation on damage and health and other things. Um, but we're not really sure how balanced those are. Like I said, last time, tanks destroyed everybody. So it nerfed tanks by... 25 health they used to have bonus 50 now they have a bonus 25 <laughs> also there's very little tanks right now so the sample size for that might be a bit biased again that is true yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's only from Everybody riding here's a, a nerf a suddenly tanks bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah tanks might be terrible we'll see oh and some of the death particles are still goofy because i haven't fixed those so you know we need water. to add a yo-yo ultra class <laughs> yeah we need we need also, model setups to work 
Go ahead. It looks like some people haven't liked the uh, stream, so they're going to get that uh, penalty bonus, unfortunately, when they're playing. Wow. Yeah, I really wish I could get into the API to do that. Like, you okay, don't get like an extra, like heals, yeah, heal for like, no, like for don't. heal. <laughs> no, <laughs> you no. can't, there's no way to do it. And I'm sure YouTube wouldn't approve. No, they would, would never awesome. allow that to happen. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. gonna make one where we don't give anything away and people just have to spam chat to fight. Like, attack, attack, attack. Whoever's whoever can type attack fastest wins. <laughs> So, yeah, we got 68 fighters left. I think this thing will finish before the end of the stream. You guys want to take one more question? Was there something else you wanted to... Yeah, there was. Gonna, there was. Oh, there was oh, a right. gonna... chat question. Let's take this one. Oh, what are your gosh. most anticipated games of 2020? This would be a great question for next uh, week where Salim's going to have 15 of them. <laughs> Anybody got... I'm, I'm just going to sadly wait for the new Bioshock, which is going to be terrible because it's not got... It is the stuff I've heard about it, and then the bit that broke my heart was when they said it's open world, Bioshock, the very heavily story driven series of games in small <laughs> underground predominantly environments. And it's like you know what we need a large open world of dynamic content. That's what'll make our story driven linear experience better. That uh, is the just, trend yeah, of twenty twenty two though. To do now. <laughs> <laughs> every yeah. every game that I've seen advertised so far really is like oh it's open world, open world, yeah. open world, it's, open it's, world. Like it's, Halo's it's okay. That. Halo makes sense because the game was all like literally the yeah. levels in Halo were already outside in vehicles. But Bioshock, man, who looks at Bioshock and goes, "This game needs to be yeah. ruined." <sighs> it's not just open world; it's open world action. <laughs> Very important. The games decided, oh, now we can uh, make enough content and uh, run it all in uh, the same uh, instance easily. So why not? It's the dream. It's a full world simulation that you can live in and immerse yourself in. <laughs> and then they shoehorn themselves into it. That said, I, I do wish anyone who's trying to take that endeavor good luck. And I hope their game ends up fun, regardless of what it is. Um, also, this question is hella loaded. I have way too many games I'm going to be able to recommend here. There's Hollow Knight, Elden Ring. Oh, um... Bomb Rush Cyberpunk is due to come out this year. Nice. That one I'm actually waiting for. You that know, one I'm, I'm super I'm... looking forward to it. Uh, Bomb Rush Cyberpunk. It's basically Jet Set Radio Future Reborn. That's sub... I'm waiting for that one for a while. Jet Set's one of my favorite games. So, I'm, I'm going to say I have two. And the first one is because I like combat-heavy action open-world games, Elden Ring. <laughs> the second one is Rune Factory 5, and I have a bit of a bias because I really love Rune Factory 4, and Rune Rife Factory 5 comes out on my birthday. So, <laughs> so when it comes out, everybody play. wish him happy birthday. <laughs> oh, the new Kirby looks good, too. That, that genuinely looks fun. There's All also right. a ton of other games. There's the sequel to Breath of the Wild is going to come out in like November. Yeah, right? yeah. It's just gonna be Breath of the Wild, but like some <laughs> other game. It's got a time thing. It's just Breath of the Wild plus. Like I don't uh, I don't care. My friend's game's coming out. Patrick's Paradox. Oh yeah. Puzzler. It's yeah, Patrick's Paradox, on... right? On Steam. We should drop a link for that in chat. When's that coming out? Is it a release date yet? Uh, early 2022. Um, but I've been enjoying the uh, the little the little previews he's given me on it, so I'll find a I'll find a link to it. But Ooh, maybe Somerville's coming it. out. That's another one I really want. That's from the um, animator of Inside and Limbo. That's going to be very gorgeous. I think we should do a stream just showing um, some of the people's games who are actually come to the stream too, because I know there are at least three mm. or four guys who are working on their own games and releasing them sometime in, in the next year or so so i guess may, if anybody's got one they, they'd be interested in having us just share talk about it or something um hit me up send me an email and i'll share with everybody and we'll see what we can do i think that'd be interesting and talk about some of the games people are actively working on and planning to release this year uh let, let them share what they've been doing and, and what that process is like a little bit it'd be a lot uh, of fun one that i'm slightly less interested in i hate to say it 
is I've been following Tunic, that game, for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, even what, watching the, like, like, back when it had a different name and I was part of the whatever, um, I, I played the demo, and it was good. It was, like, nice little pretty game with a fun mechanic, but it just felt like a simpler version of Death Star, and I was just like, I don't, this just doesn't feel like there's enough in it for me to really sink my teeth into, so I kind of felt bored after the demo, and I... Didn't, I didn't think I'd want to play anymore, which I was really bummed out about because I think it, it, I, I liked following that journey. It just doesn't appeal to me anymore. I guess that's why uh, trying to make your content as fast as possible has some merit. <laughs> Had they come sequentially, you could have enjoyed both to the fullest. Um, mm. I did look uh, into it, and apparently uh, Stranger of Paradise is supposed to come out um, this year, which is something I'm going to have a lot of fun with. Because chaos. <laughs> uh, yeah, I still think it's going to be Rune Factory 5 and Elden Ring for me. Elden Ring looks so much more fun to me than Bloodborne and Dark Souls. Uh, personally, just because of the themes, I don't see... I, I, I mean, I get there are people who have heavy appeal to uh, gothic and dark themes in action heavy games because they kind of go head in hand all the gore and all that but i i don't see the need for it and i like the more pure magic approach other ring has also being open world is a big plus because convenient quality of life features everywhere um so i'm going to have a lot i i hope i'm going to have a lot of fun with it specifically as the combat looks amazing and i like my combat Well, uh, I've just started yeah, but... playing um, The Ascent, so I'm going to be playing that well into 2022, I think. You're not just going to play the metaverse? Just, just no, jump in don't. and, and, and the, join no, the no, 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 awfulness. And but no, The Ascent. Uh, do you no. want to answer one more question while the butlers are running? Um, oh, it's not finished. It's yeah, like I think we're, all, we're, yeah. we're down to eight oh, fighters hey. left. and. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just well, see, okay. see who's the winner. Wait, am I still in? Yes. <laughs> did, did you have one you wanted to answer, Uri? Uh Yeah, there was one that is pretty interesting, and I wanted to bring up a pretty neat solution for it. Um, so let me just find it. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, I got defeated. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, so there was a question about uh, a person having a problem running some sequences. They made a state like a state machine like system, but they're not happy with it. And yeah. what they're trying to solve is an order of events that have to happen for a, for UI. For example, um, getting a daily reward and then seeing some banner for current events and getting another kind of daily reward from a pass or whatever. And how do you manage these in a way that you can uh, prevent conflict and rearrange the, system, the order of these systems. And there is a very neat one-word solution for it, I found, which is the concept of promises in the code, which I don't think gets talked about a lot. So does anyone want to cover that in a bit uh, more in, detail? In C-sharp, they're normally covered under the banner of futures. It's the same concept. It's just traditionally promises are for asynchronous web stuff, and then futures are the same thing, but for um, C sharp traditionally. Um, oh, as for as for what they are, I guess. Yes. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it probably probably helps. Um, if you if you have tasks which can be asynchronous, you can traditionally fire off a task. And what you have is is the equivalent of a ticket. It's a promise that it will be completed. And then the idea would be that when something is done, you get a callback of some kind, but you don't have to maintain it. So there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do by having something perform an action and then return back what it's doing. Finalists are uh, upon us. So is there a resource people can look at to see like an example, Yorai? uh yeah there should be one give me a moment uh, we can drop that in there because i feel like it's a interesting we should probably like dive into it in depth maybe in the next show kind of give some details in how you use this because I, I think it is interesting for just hitting the last couple seconds of time uh, okay and so we've all, I, I, I have one huge post for it actually um okay. 
I send it in the private chat. Uh, I'm going to drop that into, into the yeah. chat real quick. So it basically talks about promises, how you can implement them, how they can work in C Sharp. And I think there is even a Unity demo project somewhere in here. Um, I didn't read this for over two years, but it was great when I did read it. I've never seen years. this page. What could possibly go wrong.com? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, nice. I like it. All right. You guys ready to see the final winner? We got Tech sure. Dave and Victor. Oh, where am I? Uh, you lost. Dead. <laughs> the DPSs seemed to, so the top you four got were guide. three DPSs and a tank this time. I think mages might need a buff. A buff. We'll see that. Mage should run some actual testing. Who's going to win it? It looks like Tech that Dave is in like the lead. Oh, and there you go. Congratulations, Tech Dave. Um, email me real quick, and I will try to send you the code right after the show. If, if you, the quicker you email me, the faster. I'll get you the code. Um, yeah, congrats. Um, I'm going to close this window now and give everybody a chance to just quickly wrap things up. Anybody got any final thoughts? Um, things you just want to share for the year or that you think people should maybe do for the, for 2020 to get going and get prepared. Well, one, uh, one of the questions was any good discords. I mean, mine, yep. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, um, but it's a private, Both discord, these. so you have to, uh, it, it's a private discord for anybody who, um, donates over on Kofi. So if you, it's literally just my name on my Kofi page. That's, uh, that's where you'll find me. Yep, and that's linked down below in the description too. There should be a link straight to, let me double check that that's there, but it should be in all of them. Yep. Jason story, ko-fi.com slash Jason story is right there. Just go click on it and join his discord. And then um, after this stream, Dave is releasing a brand new YouTube video. You want to tell everybody just real quick what that is and why they need to watch it. Yeah, you've just reminded me. I've got to make it public. Yeah, I was going to um, say it's <laughs> uh, Yeah, whoops. Uh, it's public now. Um, so, yeah, people voted during the week on the poll from the channel, um, and they voted to watch quick level testing in Unity with direct play. So this is a method I use for more level-based games, like Monkeys with Guns and Turret Shooter and stuff like that I've been working on recently, where it uses... Um, a static class uh, that basically gets run uh, and puts call, callbacks in for when the editor changes play mode. And then when the editor changes play mode, if you're in a level rather than the main scene with all the prefabs of the player and all that, it loads things in for you in prefabs and then it basically starts it all off. So you don't have to go through the menu of your game to test a single level. You can test the levels really quickly. And it's a yeah. method of using prefabs and stuff to basically have items that you can basically load up in your level and get going straight away uh, rather than having to go back in, especially when you're in VR and you have to stand there like this. I'm going to press, I want to go to a level, and then I'm going to press the level, and then I'm going to press continue, and all this. It's much easier just to go boom, boom, there we go, it's playing. So there, there's a tutorial on direct play uh, that somebody had requested, and now the poll has ratified. Nice. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I mean, you said in VR, but it's helpful in anything where oh, yeah. you have any process at all. If your game isn't just press play and test it, then... Um, setting up a way that you can makes a huge difference in that iteration time to speed things up a ton and stop wasting yeah. so much time. And if you're, you're right, testing you your game, game, yeah. Uh, the votes for the finalists for the Steam Awards uh, are still going, so uh, I'm praying for uh, Ooh, go good get luck that. on that then. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Go vote uh, for Terraria. I think I've got a link for that in here as well. If not, I'm going to drop that down in the description to make sure. You can go see the see the uh, awards. This is the Steam Awards, and this was the Labor of Love Award that Terraria is up yeah. for, right? Just yeah, and, persisting uh, and being so great and constantly getting better over the years. And then most games like get released and abandoned, and this is the exact yeah, how, how many games put out their last update multiple times? <laughs> <laughs> Look, even I don't know when these stuff coming. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some fantastic uh, memes of that where people have done compilations of like this is the final update to Terraria again and again <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Uh, speaking of, I actually have to work on Terraria tomorrow because Steam Deck uh, changes, and I have a discount deck that I might be able to show off next week, which is, it, it's not a deck, it's a Ooh. machine that's going to be able to install the same software, oh, cool. uh, just awesome. so I can test the work on it and design considerations and all that. So that might be fun. Um, other than that, uh, Jason, you should probably nerf the Warriors because they won. <laughs> Got to keep that balance rotation going. And uh, I do wish everyone a fantastic new year. And mm. please try to be better than you were last year and have a better time. Uh, happy new year, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining us. And I guess we will see you all next week. Make sure you hit the like button, share the stream, uh, you know, drop a comment down below. If you got questions or things that you think we should do different, better, or already awesome. And yeah, we'll see, see you soon. All right. Goodbye, everybody. I'm just going to keep.